Peabody, that was a fantastic uh, introduction, um, and I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Martin uh, from uh, CUGH, and there he is, and um, who's going to talk on the One Health Opportunity to Save Our Planet and Ourselves. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, good morning, everybody. It is really wonderful uh, to be here at, at Einstein. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Weiss and Dr. Ashkar for allowing me to be here, and also thank uh, Jill uh, Ralphman and Catherine Michelaba. Um, put your hands up, Jill and Catherine. Ka oh, yeah, they're way back there. So they, you've done a tireless job of putting this together. Really, thank you very much. It's a bit like, absolutely. <laughs> Putting on these conferences is a little bit like what we see as an iceberg, right? Or as a duck swimming. They're preternaturally calm, but underneath that, they're ferociously paddling all the time. And so thank you so much, uh, Jill and Catherine. You've done really an amazing job. And of course, it's always amazing to work with the folks here uh, at Einstein and the folks at EcoHealth and Dr. Koresh and Catherine and Peter Daszak have been a wonderful partner for us at CUGH in all the work you've been tirelessly doing for a very long time. But things are moving forward. It has been uh, quite a remarkable last couple of uh, months, in fact. Um, we saw, of course, three timely reports come out in uh, the national media about climate change, right? But guess what? Yesterday, New York Times massive article on insect Armageddon, on the death and destruction of the substrate of all life on the planet, right in front of our noses, the massive, unrecognized, little recognized, and grossly neglected loss of the insects of this planet <coughs> happening right in front of us. So well done, New York Times, in getting this up in front of us uh, uh, yesterday um, in their wonderful newspaper. Um, but this is just the start, right? This is a wonderful movement, and I think that as many of you here have known for a long time, it has been an uphill battle to get this on the table. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to posit uh, a couple of things uh, uh, in front of you. Um, I think that, see if I got this right, right. So these are the reports that ca came out. All of us know that this is happening. For us, I think, is, as uh, scientists, of course, if you want to learn about science, what do you do? Speak to a scientist, right? So we, what I'm going to do in, in the course of this talk is it's part a challenge for all of us, all of us, to get out, get up in action, to be able to move things forward that we know in our professional lives that are going to save the planet, the species on this planet, and us. Because Earth has been ringing the 911 bell for some time, right? People have not been listening as well as they should be. We don't have time to waste. We've got to, we've got to move forward and get involved in the action and implementation that's necessary. So what I'm going to do in the course of this talk is I'm going to suggest eight opportunities, eight things in part that we can do to be able to move the ball forward and implement the things we know now are going to save ourselves our environment, and our planet. So all of us here know uh, the, the, the web of life that we live on. The, we're in the sixth extinction right now in the top. Uh, we know the destruction and impact on fresh water, the loss of uh, uh, broader biodiversity, the impact this has on uh, potential access to biopharmaceuticals, uh, the loss of ecosystems, and an opportunity I'll talk about with NCDs, climate change, air, food security, and much more. So opportunity one, I think in part, you know, in my previous job I was in politics, I was a member of parliament in Canada for 18 years, and one of the great um, challenges I found is people would come to my office, wonderful scientists, and they'd come with a brick of material and say, Dr. Martin, this is what we'd like you to digest, and secondly, this is what we'd like you to bring to the relevant minister. Now, the relevant minister is not going to read a brick like this. We have to put this material that we're doing in a form and in an amount that's digestible and usable for, for people. And that's in the interest, politically, of what they need to do, which is get reelected. Now, 
one of the challenges, I think, in opportunity is we can frame what we're doing, the One Health opportunity, as being not only the eye infectious disease challenges that Dr. Koresh so eloquently described, but also looking at it in the broader context of the social determinants of health. And we can frame this in part on the degradation of health and in terms of security outcomes. That fresh water loss and up on the top uh, left is the gross diminishment of the RLC taking place over time. We're seeing the impact of pollution in India and we know the security issues that that's posing. The loss of bees and food security, weather, uh, inclement weather through climate change. The neglected uh, loss of not only numbers but also size of biomass in the oceans and what that's doing to food security and of course the loss of uh, forests. So the second opportunity, non-communicable diseases, the runt of the litter in global health. 70% of deaths worldwide are due to NCDs, yet it receives just 2% of funding. Isn't that shocking? We've got to be able to ensure, not to take away from the infectious disease opportunities, but can we link NCDs to IDs? And I'd suggest we absolutely can. And in fact, we must. Because ecosystem integrity is actually an opportunity to address NCDs. So we have a chance to be able to link both of them together and have greater investment for both to be able to address this compelling challenge. The global health security agenda, of course, provides that opportunity. And of course, we also know the issue and challenge of antimicrobial resistance which still is neglected despite the enormous data and information that shows this is a clear and present danger to all of us. And I think that the One Health community and our colleagues in veterinary sciences are doing a remarkable job ringing the bell, but those of us who are not vets have to side with them and work with them to be able to clearly describe that the use of antibiotics in, in, in commercial animal enterprises is absolutely vitally important for our collective health. Poverty reduction. When I used to uh, do some work in, with anti-poaching patrols in Southern Africa, one of the things that was remarkable to me is the vast amount of money and, and resources that were generated, this was in South Africa, from ecotourism. Ecotourism for them represents an $8 billion US a year enterprise. And it's only scratched the surface. But what's not happening necessarily is that those resources are not being shared adequately with rural populations. The rural impoverished populations that not only provide a bulwark, an anti-poaching bulwark, but also provides an opportunity for the monies generated from these reserves to improve their lives. Because we all know that some of the most impoverished people in the world are actually living right next door to these important reserves that are generating large sums of money in a sustainable way, potentially. So this is a great chance to be able to use ecotourism as an opportunity to not only protect uh, uh, reserves and important ecosystems, but also as an agent to generate funds for, uh, for rural communities. Biodiversity hotspots. There are 35 biodiversity hotspots representing just 2.3% of the Earth's land mass. But 50% of plant species and 42% of vertebrates are there, and they're all under threat. Now, the interesting thing about this as a one health concept is that these biodiversity hotspots are also close to uh, rural populations, impoverished populations that actually rely on these hotspots in part for their social determinants of health. Imagine if we were going to focus on these 35 biodiversity hotspots as a way to be able to protect them, but integrate conservation into development as a mechanism that's going to enable us to not only <coughs> save these critical uh, uh, biodiversity areas, these ecosystems, but also be able to improve the lives of the people in those areas. What a remarkable opportunity this could be. And by the way, the IUCN has done a very good job, a superb job, of actually mapping out these biodiversity hotspots. You can, you can check it out on their website. Aggregate and, and share knowledge. 
One of the challenges that we found in, at the Consortium of Universities for Global Health that I represent is that we, um, and we're trying to do this, is to be able to aggregate and share good practices along with the evidence that's going to enable us to democratize that knowledge. And I think what's exciting about this conference and that Catherine uh, sent all of us as speakers a list of questions that we need to answer. And what she and Jill are going to do, uh, they're going to put together the findings from these two days and they're going to share it widely. And we at CUGH are going to help to share this with 30,000 people around the world. So this is a great chance for the input that you give to th at this conference that it will be used to be able to inform, mobilize folks around the world. One thing I should say is that in the, in the, the One Health, Planetary Health, Global Health work we're doing, one of the gaps that I think we need to do a better job of, and politically you need this, is to be able to, to do a better job of uh, quantifying the rate of return on some of the programs and investments that uh, we're, we're doing. So for those of you who are economists out there or are connected to economists, bringing them into, into what we're doing is an ever important effort. Because when you go to the cabinet ministers to tell them why they should do something, of course, what are they going to do? They're going to say, why should I do it? How much is it going to cost? And what's my rate of return? But if we bring in the economists, we'll do a better job of convincing them to use scarce public funds to be able to address these challenges. One of the um, uh, challenges that, that uh, uh, Jill and Catherine uh, shared with us is how can we deal with the education gap? Uh, let me share with you a little story. I was um, at the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges meeting um, a couple of years ago and I was walking by the posters and there was this dentist, young uh, woman, uh, a, dent, a, dent, a dent, young dentist, and she was showing me a program that they were doing, which I thought was absolutely floored me. This is what they did. Dentists and veter senior veterinary students under supervision went into low resource communities here in the United States. I believe it was Texas. These communities don't get access to dental care. Their pets don't get access to veterinary care. So how did you manage to overcome that? The path to engaging these communities, which were largely rural, was through the pets that they love. They'll do anything for their pets, right? So the vet students under supervision went in to provide basic animal care for these animals that wouldn't get this care, but also they were able to access primary veterinary care from the vet senior vet, uh, some primary dental care from the senior dental students. So they hit two birds with one stone. People would not get uh, oral health care, which is a huge gap in health, no matter what country you're in, at least in North America. Vet care, they were able to bring them both in under supervision from faculty. So it was a training opportunity, it was a service opportunity, and it also provided a research opportunity because you could also do research on implementation. Now imagine this. Imagine if vet, uh, vet students were working not only with dental students, but with medical students, with public health students, with nurses. Imagine the opportunities we could have about doing some very clever, hands-on, practical training along a great educational opportunity that was also matched with the service opportunity and with implementation research opportunities. Which institutions are going to learn from that? That's one health in action, right? So why don't we think for those of us who are from the academic world, can we think about doing that? I know uh, Lillian Pentea, who's there, Lillian Pachanda. So Lillian's doing some amazing work on, on the social determinants of health in, in Gombe in West Africa with the Jane Goodall Institute and West Af in, in Western Tanzania, but also West Africa. And it's kind of a really interesting way that he and his teams are combining all of that. But think about this as a way for us to be able to integrate One Health, whether we're physicians or dentists, engineers, lawyers, can we find ways of bringing these other disciplines in during the early training in a way that's integrated? And I think that could be a very practical way of uh, overcoming this and it'd be a whole lot of fun too. Um, 
I'm going to just a couple more, two more opportunities here before I close. Um, I was at a talk uh, last, actually a, a little mini conference in Washington last week, and we were, people were talking about what countries need to do about training healthcare workers, building infrastructure, being able to uh, invest in, in uh, cold chains and such. What was not discussed is a simple fact. If we want all of those things to happen, and we do, whether they happen or whether they don't, whether the money's invested in building this particular university, any university, any clinic, any hospital, any vet school, any public health school, whether you're rolling out and providing training for people, no matter where they are, those are political decisions. They are political choices. If you support climate change or not, we know that's a political choice. It's a political decision. There also has to be a capacity, if you make the choice as a politician, that you want to be able to invest in training health workers or vet workers or public health workers, and you want to invest in the money to do that and have the infrastructure people training and the substrate to deal with these challenges, you also have to have the capability in your public service to do this. And folks, if you look at the countries, and we know this, who are the most impoverished countries in the world, what do you find? You find a deep lack of capacity at many levels to be able to implement what a leader, leaders may want to do. So whether you, you have a strong Ministry of Health or not, you also need strong justice departments, you need strong <coughs> finance departments, you need strong environment departments, you need strong public works departments, and you need the people in there that can actually implement what you want to do as a government in power. If you do not have these people, and I, and I said to the folks at that call, we were talking about health, it was a global health conference, I said we're talking about ministries of health. But the Minister of Health, if you were the Minister of Health and you did not have a finance minister who understood what you're trying to do, and that finance minister didn't have the people to be able to attract tax money and use those monies effectively for the public goods the nation needs, you can't do what you want to do. You can't implement what we already know will improve the lives of people and the environments we live in. So I just say this by virtue of trying to remind us all that it is vitally important to have effective public institutions and those institutions being the checks and balances that enable any country to be able to implement good public policy. Lastly, like I said before, it's 911 time for the planet. As scientists, we need to get politically active, not necessarily in a partisan way, perhaps not in a partisan way, but being able to assert not only with policymakers, but importantly with the public. The public moves the political, right? The public moves the political. If you're in politics, you want to get elected or reelected, your constituents will have a, can have a huge sway if your office in your riding or your constituency in your state, if you're if it's running off the off the phone is running off the off the off the off the hook about an issue, you will pay attention. I guarantee that about what your constituents are saying. So I think it's up to all of us to know that we have an opportunity, an opportunity to communicate what we know, not only to policymakers but the public, of what we do and why we are doing what we need to do in the best interest of everybody. So at the consortium, briefly, of Universities for Global Health that I'm the executive director of, we're based a kilometer north of the White House. Um, Einstein is a valued member. Many of your institutions here are valuable members of us, our organization. We have 172 uh, academic institutions and are connected to consortia all over uh, the world. We worked with the EcoHealth Alliance for many years in this, in this area. Um, we, I want to share a couple of uh, uh, important things in here. We have a number of committees that members can join. Uh, I've listed them there. 
Now we just received some money from the Gates Foundation, so we'll have somebody for the next two years that can work with you to be able to influence the public and policymakers on the One Health opportunity, which is a very exciting and new opportunity for us at CUGH. We also are managing now a few training programs. The STAR program is a global health program. Half of these fellows and interns, 50 fellows, 80 interns, uh, are going to be um, um, uh, from the United States. Half are going to be from outside the US in low to middle income countries. And that's a great opportunity. We also run a public health uh, training program. We're subs on both of these with the, with the Public Health Institute. And that's for training public health fellows with the CDC. Uh, we run communications workshops. We have great capacity building uh, work that's uh, uh, done uh, also. And, um, and uh, competencies with Dr. Jessica Evert and her team in California. For Jessica, put your hand up, please. Yep, so speak to competencies and Jessica is the leader in the competencies work uh, we've been doing for many years. Uh, please speak to her about it because she's done outstanding work, which is actually also online, and she's published this work extensively. We've got a new environmental health working group with Public Health and, and One Health. We do webinars. Now, you're all invited to our conference, which is going to be in Chicago, uh, uh, March 7th to the 10th. Now, March 7th is interesting because that's a day when we run half to full day satellite sessions. So we're going to run a whole half day session on the work that we're doing on planetary health, one health, environmental health. Now the reason why we started these uh, half to full days is that there just isn't enough time in 90 minutes to really get together and do stuff, right? So we wanted to create space at our conference where people who are interested in something can come together, can collaborate, can share knowledge, and out of those can come up with some actionable plans that they can work on through the year, because a conference is a moment in time, and then meet the next year to be able to keep building on that. So we've done that with Global Cancer, six years in a row with the National Cancer Institute. We'll run our third urbanization sessions uh, on building healthy cities. Um, we're doing it with uh, surgery for three years now. We're bringing in mental health also and pediatrics uh, next year for the first time. So there's a lot of exciting things. Most of them are free to attend, by the way. So please uh, consider coming to the conference. That's our conference, uh, cugh2019.org. Um, and I'm just going to close there with, uh, and, and just say this. You know, at, at CUGH, you have a friend and a colleague uh, who want to work with you. Uh, we have a network of 30,000 uh, scientists around the world that we mobilize with. We're going to share the work that's going to come out of this conference with those 30,000 people around the world. And uh, I just encourage you to speak to people like Jessica uh, and myself, uh, since we're both here from CUGH. And uh, we look forward to the next day and a half and look forward to working with you to save the planet and ourselves and all species on the planet. So thank you for your attention. I think uh, the old Monty Python thing was, and now for something completely different. Uh, this being a, uh, a global health conference, and we're talking about technology amongst other things, um, we have a few speakers who, for various reasons, were not able to physically be here, but they're still extremely important speakers. And we're going to move one of them up because they're going to be zooming in. Correct, Jill? And the first, we're going to have three people during the course of the meeting who, who Zoom for us. But the first individual is from the World Bank, and it's Dr. Uh, Berthy. I think, do I have that right pronunciation? No? I, I can't pronounce a single name. Jill, you can speak up. Frank, Frank Berthy. Berthy, from the World Bank, on the developmental impact of One Health. So could we try and start the Zoom? And hopefully, technologically, things will go correct. Okay, so I, I I will start I will start by by thanking you very much. Um, this is a great pleasure to be uh, uh, virtually with you uh, today. I'm I'm sorry I couldn't make it uh, uh, physically. I would have enjoyed the uh, the interaction. Um, I'll spend um, a few uh, few minutes of your time uh, talking about uh, uh, one health in the. Uh, 
in the context of, uh, of, of the World Bank, trying to, uh, to, to illustrate how we, um, we use the, uh, the principles of, uh, of, of One Health and, and, um, and probably uh, a bit of, uh, of way ahead. Uh, but before, before I get there, I would like to uh, uh, bring you uh, back in time. Uh, I would like to bring you in, uh, in, in France uh, before the French Revolution in uh, 1765. Um, I'm a vet by training and, and, and I graduated in, uh, in this veterinary school of, uh, of Maison Alfort. And, and um, 1765 is, uh, is when this school has been, uh, has been established by uh, uh, Claude Bourgeola. And, uh, and one of uh, uh, the key uh, instructors at the time was uh, Honoré Fragonard, um, a surgeon. Um, a medical uh, uh, surgeon and, uh, and a barber and an anatomist, and um, and he was uh, uh, in charge of um, the uh, uh, anatomy uh, section of of, uh, of the school. At that time, um, education, veterinary education, was based on on two main pillars that were uh, the uh, the hospital and the collection. And the collection that has been established by uh, by this veterinary school has been uh, has been extremely rich, um, and as you can see on uh, on the picture, uh, it was not just about uh, animals, but also about uh, about uh, humans. And um, and um, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, uh, Heinzmann, uh, from the uh, uh, Department of uh, History of Sciences at uh, Harvard uh, University has just published a fantastic uh, paper um, explaining that uh, this collection was, uh, was of, a, of a very rich uh, diversity. And what she says is that it was uh, more than a magnet for attention, that it was uh, an intellectual and methodological uh, insistence that animals' diseases partly describe uh, their connections in the global order. And this is really interesting because uh, uh, what happened is that with the French Revolution uh, and the creation of a museum in Paris and um, and uh, an école de santé uh, in 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 Paris, this collection was completely dismantled, and uh, and this is when the the uh, uh, veterinary education was uh, constrained on uh, domestic animals only, losing uh, the uh, the broad. Uh, um, holistic uh, approach that it had before uh, the revolution, and um, and this is when probably the the, the silos were were created. So this uh, historical example is to is to probably to tell us that uh, um, one health is uh, is a uh, is a way of thinking that is uh, not new. It uh, it's probably an old way of thinking. And, um, and that uh, the struggle that we have sometimes uh, in, uh, in applying the, uh, the, the, the One Health principles um, are, not, uh, are not something uh, completely uh, uh, inherent to, uh, to uh, um, our humanity. I think, uh, I think there's hope that uh, with the, uh, the, the, the complex problems that we're facing in the world today, um, One Health will, will uh, gradually uh, come back as, uh, as, a, as a way to go forward. So uh, uh, it's a positive uh, signal that we receive from uh, from history. Um, moving to the to to the bank now. Uh, this is the, the the slide where I usually brag about the uh, the, the bank's uh, uh, capacity on uh, on one health. Um, to say that uh, uh, the bank has, has applied the, uh, the, the, the principles uh, probably even before uh, the One Health uh, uh, concept was, uh, was coined. And, uh, and the, the best example I can find is, uh, is probably this uh, uh, river blindness program, the uh, OCP for Onco Circiasis Control Program. That was a, a success story uh, between uh, WHO and, uh, and the World Bank. And, um, and where uh, the, uh, the, the idea was to combine uh, uh, public health interventions with environmental uh, uh, interventions. Um, I'm talking about this uh, program in, uh, in the 70s. And, uh, and um, of course, uh, when um, the uh, uh, H5N1 crisis uh, uh, was uh, with us, the bank was, uh, was present again. 
uh, putting together this uh, global uh, uh, program for uh, avian influenza control, the uh, um, GPAI. And, um, and I think that uh, Dr. Olga Jonas is, uh, is in the room and, uh, and she was uh, one of the key uh, operators of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, program. And, uh, and uh, more uh, recently in a post Ebola uh, um, um, period, um, the bank was, was as, um, as uh, launched this, this uh, Redise program uh, for regional disease surveillance systems uh, enhancement um, in um, in West Africa, so bank is a is a is a bit of a natural on the, on the one health, and um, this is um, not a surprise if we consider that uh, the bank is uh, is uh, supporting uh, uh, low and middle income countries to uh, to invest in uh, many different sectors um, in agriculture in environment, in health, and in climate change. And uh, as we speak today, um, the uh, COP24 is uh, meeting in Poland and, uh, and the bank has announced the, uh, um, the ramping up of, uh, of its uh, uh, financial of, of um, climate change. So we do in, invest in, uh, in uh, all these uh, uh, sectors and, and many other sectors such as uh, education, water, infrastructure, and so forth. Um, but because we've been uh, uh, trained and educated um, after the French Revolution, our brains have been uh, siloed, and uh, and it's not necessarily easy to uh, to think one health uh, um, immediately, and uh, and we need to, uh, um, to 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 put some efforts to to do that. So uh, with the uh, um, collaboration uh, uh, with the Eco Health Alliance, we've uh, developed this uh, operational framework. Um, strengthening the uh, human, animal, and environmental public health systems at their um, at their interface, and its uh, operational framework is uh, is for uh, the bank uh, a very important document, helping the uh, uh, the project coordinators, what we call the TTLs, the the the, the task team leaders, um, to think in terms of uh, of uh, cross sectoriality and approach uh, uh, problems, finding uh, um, uh, solutions and opportunities across the, uh, uh, the sectors. So uh, we, we describe the, uh, the principles of uh, One Health. We, we do insist on, uh, on the capacity of articulating uh, uh, the economic case. Um, this is very important because at the bank, uh, we, um, we essentially deal with the uh, uh, ministers of finance. We, we need to convince them to, to invest. Then we review uh, the tools that are available uh, for uh, for One Health, and we try to um, to um, help uh, um, TTLs to find uh, proper entry points to um, to, to this uh, One Health. Finally, we we, we propose uh, uh, building blocks for uh, those operations and ways to uh, monitor and upscale um, this uh, this uh, One Health. So, so the the idea there is is really to um, to structure, and instead of um, having a, a bit of a of an ad hoc approach uh, where we would do one health when uh, when it's uh, absolutely necessary, we would like to uh, to do a better job in uh, in uh, uh, um, having a, a more of uh, one health approaches in in our uh, operations and projects. Um, so it's a, it's a very uh, operational and uh, bank oriented uh, um, document, but uh, but apparently it's a, it's a document that is also uh, useful for uh, uh, other uh, institutions and uh, financial institutions. Um, I'll I'll go back to uh, to this uh, uh, case of uh, of Ebola and uh, and the importance of. Uh, of this outbreak in uh, in West Africa in um, in 2013, 14, and and um, and 15, and um, yes, of course, uh, with the uh, Redise, um, the bank is doing a good job in uh, in uh, improving the uh, the capacity of uh, countries in the region uh, in surveillance and uh, and, and reporting uh, capacity, also in diagnostic for uh, um, uh, laboratories. And, and also uh, training the, uh, uh, the workforce and, and being prepared uh, for uh, new, um, new epidemics. And, and we've seen uh, this, um, 
this uh, project in, uh, in, in action uh, in, uh, in different parts of, uh, of, um, of the region. So uh, on this Redis uh, uh, program, I was, um, I was trying to stress the fact that um, it, 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 is a, it is a good, it's, it's a good uh, interaction between um, agriculture and public health. Um, and and it, it shows probably uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 strength, but also the the, the weaknesses of um, of our approach, where uh, we don't uh, um, consider enough of uh, of the environmental uh, compartment of uh, of um, one health, and 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 two, we're still very much uh, focused on uh, on preparedness and and response, uh, uh, but uh, but uh, we we have probably. Uh, a better job to do in um, in in uh, and this will be my, my my last slide in anticipating uh, the problems rather than trying to uh, to respond to them in in this slide uh, we 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 have a, a, a map of um, of drivers of the spillover uh, of the uh, of the Ebola outbreaks in um, in uh, in West Africa in, in 2013, and you can see on the right side of the of the slide this long list of uh, of drivers, including um, um, access to forest, uh, food prices, food security, hunting, uh, and 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 forest fragmentation, and and and. You, you can see that uh, there's a broad variety of, of drivers and probably addressing those drivers would be uh, would be a good idea instead of being being uh, uh, obsessed by by the response part of um, of one health that would be more on the prevent part of uh, of this uh, of this one health that we should we should invest more and I hope that uh, uh, the bank can uh, can go into that uh, in, into that uh, direction. So I will uh, I will stop there. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope um, the uh, technology was on our side and that you 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 could get uh, some of my uh, of my messages uh, today. Thank you very much. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Avora. Uh, from the CDC, who's going to talk about tales from the CDC, Dr. Vora. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is great to see such an important um, meeting, and I'm you know, thrilled that it's here in New York City. Uh, a little bit about myself. So I'm a CDC employee. I'm stationed out of New York City. I work through the New York City Health Department, and I focused on emergency preparedness and response, mostly towards infectious diseases. Uh, I previously went at CDC headquarters. I was in the pox virus and rabies branch at CDC, so I did a lot of zoonotic disease work. Um, so specifically, I'm called a, a career epidemiology field officer, and my team's name is Informatics, Informatics Data and Outbreak Response. So um, just a little bit about how I got here, because there might be some students in the room. Um, I joined CDC through this thing called the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Um, if you've seen Contagion, uh, which I watched like the day it came out at 12.01 a.m., um, I did Kate Winslet's job, or back in the day. It's uh, normally not that glamorous, fortunately, um, and we don't die, uh, generally. So, <laughs> zoonoses. Uh, I want to give us some basic terms so that we're all on the same page. Uh, a zoonotic disease, I'm, as I'm going to use it here, there's, there's various different definitions, uh, but I'm going to consider it a human pathogen with a non-human animal source. And emerging infectious diseases, these are infectious diseases whose incidence uh, has increased or threatens to increase in the near future. So for me, uh, this paper right here, I came across it as a medical student. I was taking an extra year in med school, spending most of that year in rural Uganda doing malaria and HIV work. And I've always been um, very interested in how the environment and human health uh, interact with each other. And this paper brought everything into focus for me. Uh, it's, it's a landmark paper. It's been cited many times. Uh, it has EcoHealth Alliance co-authors, uh, among other people. And basically, they looked at trends in emerging infectious disease events around the world. And uh, they basically document that 
emerging infectious disease events have increased over time from the 1940s through 2000s. And most of these events uh, are uh, emerging infectious disease events are zoonotic diseases, and they have uh, wildlife sources in many cases. And so that really helped me understand uh, very clearly that interplay between environment, animals, and human health, really that one health concept. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more now about bats, um, which I love. They, are, they provide major ecological resources, but they've also been implemented as reservoirs for a number of high-consequence diseases, including Lyssa viruses, uh, filoviruses, and Hanipa viruses. Um, and there's a variety of factors that might contribute to their ability to harbor these various different viruses, including their population densities and their ability to fly around. So I'm going to take you, uh, the, the purpose of this talk, I really want you to get one message out of it, which is a health threat anywhere is a health threat everywhere. And so I'm going to tell you two stories uh, in the time I have, uh, one international and one domestic. So first we're going to go to Idanre, Nigeria, which is in a rural part of Nigeria. Uh, we know that Nigerian bats are reservoirs to uh, many different viruses, including Lagos bat virus and Peggy virus. Um, and so we had heard about this festival that takes place in this part of rural Nigeria. And I want to make clear that um, you know, there's a lot of different parts of the world where people uh, consume wildlife. Uh, we do it here in the United States. It gets done abroad. And so this uh, story that I'm about to tell you is not to uh, paint any particular activity in a negative light. It's just to uh, tell you about a situation that we heard about and be cognizant that people are interacting with wildlife in a variety of different ways around the world, including in the United States. So we had heard about this festival in Nigeria twice a year. There are these sacred caves in this part of Nigeria where only during these two times of the year are people allowed into the cave. And it's the local king with his priest that decide now is the time of the year. And it's only men who are allowed inside of the cave. So they, they run into these caves, and they're catching all the bats they can, typically without any personal protective equipment. I mean, they don't have shirts, shoes. They're just catching bats, swinging branches, knocking down bats, picking them up. And then these bats are cooked and eaten, um, and also used in various other cultural activities. And so here's an example of a bowl of bat soup. Um, and so I've told you a little bit about this festival already, but you know, our concern, again, based on what I told you, is that we know that Nigerian bats might harbor dangerous viruses. Um, and in particular, these caves are known to harbor Rosetta aegypticus bats, which are a, a reservoir for Marburg virus, which is a filovirus in Central Africa. So we were concerned, like, are there any health risks associated with this activity? And so here are some examples. And I want to be very clear again, uh, unless you have the proper training, do not touch bats. Here's an example of one of the bat hunters with, with um, some of the, uh, one of the bats he had caught in. Here are other bat hunters, and you can see the slingshot around one of the peop uh, person's necks. And here's a pile of, of the catch after the festival. And so, like I told you, you're only allowed once a year into, or twice a year into this cave with special permission. Uh, we had heard about this. I'm a federal government worker. It takes a long time to get our travel approved. And this, uh, you know, when we travel there, we had to go around in bulletproof vehicles with armed guards with AK-47s. And so um, it took a lot of time to get their approval, and we missed the festival by one week. So we had to get special permission again that our team could go inside of the case. And so here we are with the, the king in his palace, and, and he did grant us permission to enter the caves. And, and again, I want to emphasize that when we do this type of international work, you really want to team up with local colleagues who are experts. So we work with the local Ministry of Health, um, the Nigerian Ministry of Health, and also with the local community. This, this, everything is done in partnership. And so you know, we went out to the cave. So here we are checking through, trekking through the forest with our equipment. Because we had two major objectives. Once we, one is that we wanted to understand what type of pathogens are harbored by these bats. And then we also wanted to understand the health risks to the humans who are interacting. And so you can see my friend Michael in the foreground here in the circle. And the cave is back there. And there's huge boulders. And so you have to scale over them, very slippery and damp. And then you descend down into the cave. You're in that space suit. And once you're in there, it's pitch black except for your light. The floor is literally moving with frogs, lizards, bugs. Bats flying everywhere is the type of stuff I love. Um, it's dripping on you from the ceiling. You don't know if it's condensation or bat urine. It's amazing. And so uh, you know, we, we did that type of work. And I'm going to go into that in a moment. And then I also told you that we, you know, at the end of the day, we're here to think about human health as the CDC. And so we did a lot of extensive surveys in the surrounding communities uh, and meeting with local uh, leaders as well, as in this example. 
And so um, in terms of the bat work that we did, we're still getting out the results, but we recently, actually just earlier this month, we published one of our papers where we identified a novel species of Bartonella, which is a type of bacteria that we also show is capable of infecting humans. Uh, in the past, before I joined the team, um, we actually discovered a novel SARS-like coronavirus, and so there are definitely pathogens that circulate in these bats. And then when we interviewed the people, this is just a very high-level summary, but of people who reported participating as bat hunters, 80% had reported bat scratches, 72% had been bitten by bats, and only 2% had ever received rabies vaccine. That's a health inequity, right? That's, to me, very concerning that if there was a situation like that in the United States, we would act immediately, right, because you have a, a high-risk group of people who are very susceptible to getting um, very deadly infectious diseases. And so right here, it points to a major gap in health security. And so there's a lot of thoughts that I you know, want you to all leave you all with. Um, you know, when we did this work, actually, we didn't hear of any reported outbreaks after the festival, which is a major question. Why is that the case? Um, you know, you have to think about how do you intervene in these types of things, because you have to be very culturally sensitive, and you don't want to tell people what they can and cannot do. But at the same time, you want to give them the tools so that they can protect themselves. And again, this is why we team up with the Ministry of Health in this type of work. Um, One Health is more than just having animal <laughs> health and human health experts working together. We really have to employ a, a more comprehensive model, which involves an environmental science and also anthropology in, in a case like this. Um, local capacity building is of utmost importance. Um, you know, we want people around the world to be able to do their own outbreak investigations because the faster people can implement those investigations and stop an outbreak, the better it is for the world. And then just the, another question to think about is that West African Ebola uh, outbreak um, from 2014, you know, there's still a lot of questions about what was the inciting event. And when you think about activities like this, it might give us better perspective as to how um, outbreaks can start and then snowball. I'm going to tell you a little bit about rabies now. Um, rabies is basically the deadliest infectious disease there is. The case fatality rate approaches 100%. Um, it's caused by viruses within the family Rhabdoviridae, the genus Lysivirus, and it's typically transmitted through the bite of an infected animal. It's shocking to me, over 50,000 people a year die of rabies. And these are all preventable deaths. Most of these rabies deaths are related to bites from dogs. And uh, most of these deaths are occurring in Africa and Asia. And so again, like I told you before, I wanted to bring a state side now, right? So I gave you an example of uh, an event internationally. Now let's talk about you know, what type of One Health considerations do we have here in the United States? We're at one of the premier academic institutions in the United States today. And these are the types of things that all clinicians need to be thinking about. Um, so to start off with, we're going to go back to 2011. A person basically got a kidney transplant, so let's, we're going to consider that day zero. The transplant went well. All right? I, I think he had had the transplant for hypertensive nephropathy. 17 months later, so when they do these transplants, quite often the, that kidney is put into the hip area. 17 months later, he started having pain in that hip area. He was admitted to a hospital within um, like a week. He had lower extremity weakness, it progressed, he, his mental status changed, and he died 18 months after that transplant. So an, um, an autopsy was performed. Very astute clinicians thought of rabies, and again, the front lines of public health are clinicians. They thought of rabies, they sent specimens to us, and indeed, we found rabies virus antigens within those specimens. And then we sequenced it, and we found that it was the raccoon variant of the rabies virus. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about rabies across the United States. We have bat rabies everywhere in the United States, okay? But there are also um, terrestrial reservoirs, meaning ground animals can also harbor rabies. Uh, on the eastern seaboard, we're mostly concerned about raccoons, uh, but also skunks, foxes in various parts, and mongoose in Puerto Rico. So on average, there are around two human deaths from rabies every year in the United States. And during 2000 through 2010, all but two of the domestically acquired human rabies cases were associated with bats. But those two exceptions, one was in Puerto Rico with the, with the mongoose variant, and the other was in Virginia with the raccoon variant. And this is kind of interesting because actually um, 
every year in the United States, there are more rabid raccoons reported than rabid bats, right? Yet we see a lot more bat rabies in humans. And there's a lot of different reasons why that might be the case. And that, that last bullet might be old data. Uh, I haven't seen the more recent reports, but this is at least as of several years ago. So you know, there's a lot of questions here, right? How was this deceased kidney recipient exposed to rabies virus? Well, in, in like doing these interviews, there were no reported exposures to potentially rabid animals. He didn't report any international travel and he had no occupational risk, so he wasn't a vet or anything like that. But he did have that history of kidney transplantation. So before this event, there had been two prior rabies clusters associated with transplantation, in 2004 and in 2005. And in these clusters, all of the solid organ recipients who were unvaccinated for rabies at the time of transplantation ended up developing rabies within six weeks of transplantation and then died. But, you know, so obviously something different was going on over here, right? Because what I told you was that this one person that I described had had his transplant 18 months before his death, right? So something very different was going on. So we initiated an investigation because we did want to find out how had he been exposed to rabies. Um, and then we also wanted to make sure any other recipients of organs from that same donor to see how they were doing. So let's uh, quickly talk about the methods. I mean, we, we reached out to the organ procurement organization that had coordinated recovery and distribution of the organs, and we did a lot of contact to medical providers and donors and recipients. Okay, so uh, we did a variety of different laboratory tests. Um, we were able to get autopsy specimens from that de deceased kidney recipient, and uh, I'm gonna go into more of those specimens in a moment. So let's talk about the donor, all right? So the person from whom the organs were procured. That person had died in 2011, so heart, liver, and both kidneys were transplanted into four recipients. Um, no recipient had been vaccinated at the time of transplantation. And so when that organ donor had died, he had actually undergone an autopsy. And the autopsy report suggested that he had died of gastroenteritis. But when we did our chart review in the course of this investigation, in retrospect, it actually looked like his clinical course was consistent with rabies. So here's the timeline, right? So again, we already talked about the deceased kidney recipient who after 18 months unfortunately had passed. And then here's the donor who had, had the onset of his fatal illness was 20 days before his death, or actually 17 days, he died. And then within three days, that first transplant happened, or one of the transplants happened, right? But there were three other, well, so, so then the other thing, let's just continue on for the, uh, the donor. And what you see here is that, um, like I told you, that we had done, or they had done an autopsy on the donor back in the day. They suggested he had died of gastroenteritis. But we were actually able to, uh, working with colleagues at the site of where, his transplant, uh, where, where he had died, we were actually able to obtain specimens from the freezers from his autopsy. We got them to CDC, and within hours, actually, we were able to detect rabies virus antigen within the nervous system tissues of that donor. So we basically confirmed that the donor had, in fact, actually died of rabies. Then we did additional sequencing. So we sequenced that donor's version of rabies and also the kidney transplant recipient who had died. And when we did that sequencing, basically, you can do a phylogeographic analysis, and they both clustered to the same type of, um, for lack of a better term, genetic sequence from the same part of North Carolina. And that donor had actually come from North Carolina. So it's all making sense scientifically here now. At this point, I mean, basically, given how rare rabies is, at this point, we've proven that definitively organ transplantation was the mode of transmission for rabies virus. So, you know, what had happened to that donor, right? How come he died of rabies and did he ever receive vaccination? So we did the interviews with the donor's family members. It turns out that he was an avid hunter and he had actually sustained raccoon bites 18 months and seven months prior to symptom onset, but he never received rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. And so as I mentioned, there were three other recipients of organs from that same donor. We reached out to them. So this is all around 18 months later. Um, all of them were healthy, well, no evidence of rabies. We gave them post-exposure prophylaxis with rabies vaccines and immunoglobulin, and to date, they do well. So there's a lot of other like scientific questions that become interesting in this, uh, from like how is this happening, uh, and and obviously you know, we we want to learn as much about this as possible so that we can prevent this from happening in the future. And so when you look at the the 
kidney recipient, the heart recipient, and the liver recipient. We tested them for antibodies at the time of reaching out. So these are the three people who survived. None of them have had antibodies to rabies in their blood at the time of testing them when we figured out that the other recipient had died of rabies. Um, and then we also did a variety of testing and biopsy specimens from all of these uh, recipients, including um, the person who had died. And in these various biopsy specimens from the actual transplanted organs, we didn't find any evidence of rabies virus nucleic acid or antigen. So, you know, what I described here uh, in, in conclusion is human rabies, fortunately, is rare in the United States, not so around the rest of the world. Um, and what we document here is the third documented rabies virus transmission event through solid organ transplantation in the world. Since then, there have been other ones, unfortunately. Um, and there's a lot of other scientific questions that, you know, we can pose and we can talk about, but I'm going to skip through them in the interest of time. I just want to leave you with some final thoughts, is that clinicians are the front lines of public health. Um, a health threat anywhere is a health threat everywhere. You know, why does CDC invest in sending people like me to, um, you know, all over the world? And it's because people can get on a plane and they can travel with infectious diseases and that, you know, can lead to importation of the diseases. So we have to always be vigilant for this and build security for health around the world and build capacity. Um, if you are here in, in New York City and you are uh, a clinician, you're a veterinarian, et cetera, we have a 24-7 number that can always be called, and you can reach out to us for any public health concern, and that number is listed right here. And any students in this room, I just think public health is the most exciting career in the world, and you get to have a very positive impact um, in, in this type of work, so I, I strongly encourage that. So, thank you. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome you back from the break and to introduce Olga Jonas from the Harvard Global Health Initiative, who's going to be discussing uh, reducing socioeconomic socio consequences. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you. Um, I am here to talk about the economic impacts and the economic considerations that come um, into uh, thinking about One Health and how um, it helps uh, to justify it, or you know, why does it help to justify One Health approaches? Um, so um, I'm an economist. I'm not particularly uh, educated in any kind of disease things, but I've learned a lot about um, this area of work in um, at the World Bank, where I was responsible for coordinating the avian and pandemic influenza. Uh, response since 2005, so the last 10 years that I was at the World Bank. Um, so what is this about? It's mostly about the epidemics and pandemics, the, the impacts that arise because of those and how do those events happen um, and how are the One Health uh, um, approaches relevant. Uh, we heard earlier from Billy Karesh and others that uh, the majority of these kinds of um, um, epidemic outbreak or pandemics happen, I mean, originate in animals. They are zoonotic, um, zoonotic origin. So I'll tell you about the impact and the magnitudes of the impacts of these events um, and what are the characteristics that uh, help understand why One Health approaches are really indispensable, we think. Um, so what causes the impacts in epidemics and pandemics? Um, number one is surprise. We are not prepared. And so the impact is greater because of the surprise element. Um, another one is time. Um, the problem grows exponentially. You know, two infect four, infect 16, etc. cetera. Um, so the, you, if you wait, you are just doomed to pay a much higher price. So time is essential. And then uh, the last one that des deserves sort of to be highlighted is behaviors. It's not really the pathogens, it's the people, right? How people react to the event and how public health authorities help them react better or not. And so the most devastating impacts happen because uh, um, the behaviors are, you know, rational for the people that are reacting, 
but they are not uh, helpful. I mean, they, are, they generate a much more costly event. So that makes it quite different from, uh, you know, say other diseases, or especially in a clinical setting or uh, curative medicine. Um, and then we are going to look at whether we want to spend more money <laughs> to prevent these kinds of events and, or to mitigate them. And what should the money go for? Um, we, are, we have been arguing for uh, more than 10 years is that the core veterinary and human public health functions, the core public health functions, are really the ones that are essential to, to prevent these events and they are grossly under, underinvested in. They, they, do not, they don't get the attention, they don't get the funding. Um, these functions um, do prevention, so they prevent outbreaks from uh, becoming larger epidemics. So that's you know, very helpful because the larger epidemics are much, much costlier. And if they, are, if they are not prevented, the epidemics, then they are about mitigation. And in the mitigation measures, it's um, um, you know, preparedness to respond in a pandemic. There's a whole sort of field of uh, you know, practice that, that prepares for pandemics or vaccination. Um, to you know, mitigate the impact of a pandemic once it's actually occurring or, or a large epidemic. And um, the you know, general preparedness for functioning of society because these events can have very uh, uh, far reaching and uh, you know, profound impacts on um, economic activity and uh, such. So preparedness for that is, is something that should be happening. And so, and also, how um, we end with how how does it work in practice? I mean, what are the sort of what's the big picture? Um, what it, what does it mean the One Health approach? Um, so the impact on the global economy. The World Bank did a lot of work on this in um, as part of the Indian flu response, and um, this was taking the impact of SARS and using the World Bank's macroeconomic model to try to figure out how much it would cost, how much the next one might cost. And so the numbers that come out is uh, that a mild pandemic would be less than 1% of GDP, and that's still a lot of, you know, that's a lot of um, economic damage, um, or about $1 trillion in today's economy. Moderate would be about, um, you know, a little bit more than twice this large. And the severe pandemic, the sort of the worst case scenario that has been modeled um, since 2008 when the original studies were done, would be 4.8% of GDP, the impact. <laughs> Our uh, today's economy, it would be more than $6 trillion. And 4.8% of GDP, just you know, for context, is, is, a, is a, a little bit worse than the financial crisis of 2008. So this is a severe global recession, you know, very, very um, costly event. And so how to think about it, you know, how much does it cost us every year? So when you combine the probabilities of a mild and moderate and severe pandemic um, over, a over a century, um, you know, the plausible scenario is that there will be maybe one severe pandemic and then you know, half of a moderate pandemic over 100 years. And so the, over a century, the costs that we have been working with is uh, $8 trillion. And so what does it mean every year? Well, it, you know, $8 trillion <laughs> divided by 100, because there are 100 years in a century. So what we are looking at is pandemic risk. The pandemic risk is a, you know, that's the economic risk. Uh, it means an annual expected value of the impact. It's about $80 billion a year. Now, is this a lot or is this uh, not, not a lot? Um, you know, how, how big is this $80 billion a year that we are fa facing just from pandemic flu or a similar kind of uh, pandemic? So $80 billion is about the size of the economy of 10 countries like Bolivia, Cote d'Ivoire, Nepal, Uganda, and Uruguay. So it's as if one of these countries was disappearing every year, okay? 
or uh, if you look at the, all the economies in the world um, and add up the GDP, then more than half of all the countries, the smallest ones, um, have a um, together um, economic output of uh, um, less than 80 billion a year. So 80 billion, and it's also about twice the amount that we spend on development assistance for health every year, right? So th this is a very, very large amount and it shouldn't be ignored. However, it is ignored, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because we don't put it into our sort of considerations of you know, macroeconomic prospects for any country or, or for the world. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's seldom mentioned. It's, it's basically ignored as if the risk didn't exist, but actually the risk is pretty big. Um, so it should not be ignored, and, but, um, and then if you compare it to studies of the economic impacts of climate change, um, the, the risk from climate change, the annual value of economic impact, expected economic impact, is about the same. Um, and it's actually, this is the 80 billion a year, is a little bit less than the risk of uh, AMR, okay, antimicrobial resistance. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's significant also compared to the other global risks that, um, you know, we are concerned about. And so we should be concerned about this risk um, sort of to, to the same kind of extent. It shouldn't, shouldn't be ignored. Um, and um, so the, on the impact of a pandemic, um, I mentioned that behaviors are the, the sort of the main part. And if the cost of this, uh, say, 8 billion over, over a century is broken down, by expected medical costs and mortality and illness and absenteeism and the you know, cost of that, the sort of the foregone wages. And these avoidance behaviors, then most of the costs are from the avoidance behaviors. And this is you know, the rational reactions of people trying to avoid being infected or reacting to the situation, when the emergency when, it, when it's underway. So it's, um, it's very, very large. It's much larger than the medical costs and the mortality, which is typically what the costs we are, you know, you see when you um, see like the reports on the Ebola uh, crisis, the costs, um, those, the, the orange and, and pink costs are usually added up pretty well and, and publicized, but it really underestimates uh, the, the total impact. Um, so healthy people cause most of the damage, um, and they also, the behaviors are instrumental in how effective disease control can be or, or, or is, but they have to cooperate with public health authorities. Um, and to prepare for these impacts, it's, you know, it's useful to do communications planning and social and anthropological analyses, and th these are seldom done or they are, you know, they are much less frequent than, or less emphasized than, say, R&D on new vaccines, okay? R&D on well, new vaccines always gets uh, you know, a lot of attention, quite justly, but these aspects are generally underfunded and underappreciated. And uh, on zoonoses, there is a particular aspect which is uh, that you can easily have the wrong kind of communications. And a sort of glaring example of this recently was the swine flu in 2009. It was a misnomer for what was happening, okay? It was not swine flu. It was H1N1 pandemic flu. And, but some you know, media picked up the term swine and, and it just, you know, they think it looks better in headlines. And this had real costs to the pork producers and, and you know, exports of, of um, pork products suffered. So for zoonoses, it's um, just at the start of naming these diseases, it's really important to uh, you know, get it right because swine flu is a disease in swine. I mean, it's a real disease, right? Um, so um, now to think about how to, how, to, uh, how to tackle this danger. Okay, so, so this is our world. Uh, <laughs> 
I mean, very sim sim simplified. There are people and animals um, and environment kind of on, on the bottom. And then on top, there are pathogens. And uh, then there's also AMR that's out there. And what we need is defenses against the pathogens. So we have human public health systems. This is you know, the surveillance and the, the capacity to analyze and, and generate um, sort of response strategies to, to, and to uh, events. And we have the veterinary public health system. And they all have holes. You know, there are many wheels, many, many weak spots in, the, in these systems. So the defenses are pretty shaky, especially on the veterinary side. And then um, these pathogens and AMR are, you know, they are one health uh, threats. So um, they can go through any of the holes in these systems, um, and especially the hole between the two systems, uh, which is the, you know, they, the role of these systems is to detect early, diagnose correctly, and respond effectively. And um, so there are many weak spots, and between them is the big weak spot of uh, if there is lack of cooperation, this is where we need one health. Okay, one health means closing that gap, basically. Uh, so that the systems would work um, against any, because the pathogens don't necessarily distinguish between the humans, I mean, the kinds of animals that they attack. And these um, systems have to exist in countries or you know, communities locally, um, regional, and, and as well as global. It's not enough to work at the global level. Um, every country, because uh, the CDC just told us that the threat anywhere is the threat everywhere, right? So this is actually true. Um, so um, they have to work everywhere. So um, this is the world, another reason why the risk um, of, of sort of zoonoses and why One Health is important is that this is the world population of human managed animals. Okay, 70 billion. So this is a uh, lot, and it's growing. <laughs> and the red line is the uh, meat consumption in um, low and middle income countries. And you can see how it has, you know, it's out, outstripping very rapidly the, the global growth. And the, it's a problem because this growth is happening in countries with weak, um, especially veterinary systems, but also public health systems. They are very weak. So this growth of the risks is taking place in, in the countries that can, they are least able to, to uh, um, you know, mitigate. OK, so then these are some impacts of actual um, infectious disease outbreaks. And I mentioned SARS before. SARS cost somewhere between 40 and 54 billion dollars uh, for about 8,000 cases. And um, Ebola, the new estimate of the full cost, meaning response and economic cost, is about 53 billion dollars. And there was also a notable case of imported Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in 2015 in Korea which you know, caused only 186 cases of illness, but it cost um, um, $8 billion was the economic cost of that outbreak. So when you, the last column, when you look at that, this is, uh, shows a couple of things. Um, one, it, you know, it's, it differs from outbreak to outbreak. There's a different level of the costs, like the extreme is in the Korea, which is a you know, very high income economy. And um, there was the impact on tourism was devastating for six months. Um, so it was $44 million per case. Okay, that was, that was the economic cost. So a huge economic cost for something for relatively few sort of small public health problem. 186 cases of infections is, is a very small um, sort of share of a Korean you know, burden of disease in a, in a year. Um, so it, 
an image. It, it, it shows that it can, it's sort of unusually high, the economic costs per case. The number of cases may be low, and so you know, maybe sometimes these diseases get dismissed because, oh, you know, the number of um, um, sort of um, people who are infected or who die, like in, in um, Ebola, the number of deaths was uh, about 11,000. Well, you know, that's the burden of preventable childhood deaths in all developing countries every day, right? So it's a, it's a very, uh, uh, it looks small in terms of the human health impact, but then the economic impact is very high per case. And also um, the human health impact is small because the outbreaks were contained, right? So they did not get to become a big problem. One sort of notable outbreak that has not been contained is AIDS, or it's you know, detected very late and sort of um, controlled with, with great difficulty over time, and that has caused 35 million deaths. So if these, the, you know, the health problem looks small, if if the outbreaks are stopped, but uh, that's in a way mis very misleading about the importance of these outbreaks because they could get large. And that's maybe sometimes not appreciated. So can we reduce pandemic risk? So, you know, there's, I mentioned there's low awareness and also because they are international, it's, it's difficult to work across countries. Um, the weak public health systems are the most important sort of impediment to reducing the risk, um, poor governance, and the animal health systems are very bad, so the you know, One Health approaches can help. And the good news is that there's lots of scientific progress and uh, there is cooperation and globalization you know, can work in our favor also. And there's also a good under better understanding of the uh, human psychology of um, why people have difficulty reacting to, to um, sort of rare events, um, the low probability, high consequence risks. Um, there's also international cooperation with um, the international health regulations that is in place. It's an international law. It requires countries to detect and, and um, have the capacity to detect and, and report and cooperate in disease control. So it's possible to prevent pandemics, you know, in, in theory, if these systems are better. Um, so what does this imply for the use of the um, One Health approach? Um, so this is from the International Institute of Medicine, or now the National Academy of Medicine, a report in 2008, which provided this schematic picture of how an outbreak moves over time or what, what, what happens over time. So first there's exposure in animals, um, then there are clinical signs in animals, and it's like incidents, you know, incidents of this is what you see across time. Um, as, and then there's exposure in humans and clinical signs in humans. Um, and then humans seek medical care because um, and sometimes it's only detected then, you know, by, by that time it's late. Because what happens to the cost is that it moves like this. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an exponential, anyway, it rises very rapidly the longer you, you wait. And so One Health means um, control at the source. I mean, this is uh, sort of the basic meaning and, and it's more effective. So it's a Economically, it's an effective approach because you can control early. You know, it's easier to control something early. But what we have is we have weak veterinary capacity, so there is little or no surveillance in animals, and so disease control at the animal source is impossible. And now this black um, sort of curtain hanging over, you know, what we know is the reality. Um, is actually a policy choice. It's not something that's immutable. This is what we have decided to do. We are not looking. And if we are not looking, we don't see. Okay, so One Health <laughs> is about breaking this up so that we can see and we can you know, have control at the source. 
Um, okay, now another example of where sort of weak links matter, this is now about the problem of weak links, was Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Um, it was the worst engineering disaster anywhere. I mean, it was costliest, you know, in the um, amount of damage that was caused. And afterwards, there were investigations about why did the levees fail and, you know, what went wrong. Many expert reports. And so the experts found that the faults in design and in the building of the levees were not sufficient to cause the disaster. They would have, you know, stopped the surge of the water. Um, but the failures all tended to appear at the joints. So when one levee met another levee, the joint between those two was not engineered, and it was sometimes under nobody's authority, like if one levee was in one parish and another one, you know, the, the joint itself was not managed as part of the system. And, um, and that's where the failures occurred, okay? Uh, power stations and levees sort of being joined together. Um, so they found that nobody was responsible for the joints. They were not engineered, they were not maintained as part of the system. They were improvised. I mean, these were you know, competent engineers building these systems, but it, it, was, imp it was improvised, it was not managed. Um, so they concluded that it was not a system, but a disjointed agglomeration of parts. And I think you know, this is a nice um, sort of analogy to how we have organized ourselves to deal with these um, zoonotic threats and uh, pandemic risk. So the One Health approach um, is about managing the, the risks at the joints. And you cannot do it just by accident or by, you know, inadvertent, improvised. Um, it has to be a deliberate um, 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 action. So if once that happens, you know, how, how beneficial are the one, one Health approaches and the strong public health systems? I mean, this is, it's always strong public health systems using One Health approaches. It's, you know, not just coordination of between two systems that don't exist because that you know, doesn't really do anything. Um, so we have calculated the rates of return on, on these um, investments and this was um, spending $3.4 billion a year in developing countries every year for investment and operations and maintenance on core veterinary and human public health systems. And um, then um, the benefit was what I just showed you, the, the, you know, the corresponding to the $80 billion a year risk, which would be reduced. It, you know, if it was uh, reduced only by 20%, so that's the first line, um, it would, um, the expected rate of return is 25% a year. Okay, so it, fa it fails 80% of the time in preventing a pandemic, but even if it succeeds only 20% of the time, the rate of return is 25% a year. Um, if it prevents half of the pandemics, the rate of return is 57% a year, which is you know, way much more than what you are getting on your IRAs. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, and what we are getting on anything else, right? And if it's, if it, you know, in the scenario where it's 100%, the rate of return is 86% a year, which is, you know, astronomical. And it goes to the, you know, it, 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 it's based in, on the fact, underlying economics of it, which is the exponential growth, if, if nothing is done early, right? Uh, as well as the idea of the gaps, right? That, that, that there are critical gaps um, in the, uh, low and middle income countries, the critical gaps are often the whole system, but in some middle income countries, it's just additional investments to you know, make them work um, up to standards. And then we did the same, this is at the World Bank, um, we did these calculations. And then um, the, for AMR, which is a similar problem, and it's the same systems that you need to, to you know, prevent AMR from expanding and you need also additional investments but if if those 
total investments, I think it was $9 billion a year in low, low and middle income countries. So it's much more than just for the pandemics, but it includes the core um, public health systems. Then the rate of return is, you know, in different scenarios, 40, 60% a year, right? So again, for comparison, Warren Buffett, who um, is the, you know, the most successful investor of our era, um, his best investments ever were like 21% a year, 22% a year, 41% a year. I mean, those are his five top investments. And his you know, very best investment, just made probably a fluke given the other ones, was like 52% you know, a year. So we are looking at investments that have a higher rate of return than what Warren Buffett, Buffett has achieved. A much higher, like you know, double, three times. And then the last line is the World Bank financing the rates of return on all projects that were finished in the, well, there was a study, you know, review of, of the rates of returns of projects, and those were 24% a year. These are public sector projects in developing countries, or the countries got the, you know, borrowed from the World Bank, and those projects um, achieved 24% a year, which is, you know, very, I mean, that's very good, but it's much less than uh, what we can achieve with public health systems. Um, so um, you still have to invest in the, in the public health systems. Um, so where, where do we start in, in um, you know, which, which diseases, and I think it was alluded to about non-communicable diseases, about how they are important also, and there are all these other diseases, there are many diseases, right? And so where, where do you start in deciding um, where to invest? So um, we have the line A is the pandemic risk. That's what I just showed you. So the benefit is, well, in the 100% you know, success scenario is 80 billion. But you, know, you could change it to 40 and still get the same kind of result I mean, if you are only half as effective. And so the, and the annual cost here includes not only the public health systems in developing countries, which are 3.4 billion a year, uh, but also 1.1 billion for R&D for um, vaccines and diagnostics, right? Which is often the sort of the, the first, especially in the medical community, is the first item that comes up, you know, new vaccines. So that's included. Um, and that's from the National Academy of Medicine report, also the, the 4.5, okay? Um, so the benefit cost ratio is 18, meaning for every dollar invested, you get $18 of benefits. And for non-communicable diseases, there was a, a big uh, prioritization of different you know, um, interventions that would be the best interventions. And um, that's uh, published by WHO a couple of years ago. And the annual benefit presented there was 25 billion for between now and I think it was 2030. And the annual cost was $8 billion. So the benefit cost ratio is three. So, the, you know, like if you have to deal with something first, it makes sense to deal with the infectious disease and AMR burdens because they have a much higher um, bang for the buck or, you know, cost effectiveness. And that's. Um, the non-communicable disease prevention is still extremely effective, right? It's far more effective that, than most of health spending, right? The, the three uh, you are looking at is, 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 is still pretty good compared to the you know, health care and the sp spending that occurs. So I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, but, but you know, if we are prioritizing um, and interested in effective use of public funds to uh, reduce burdens of disease, this is, this is it. So reducing it first is going to, you know, it, it makes sense because then you have more resources left over for other disease burdens. And so in practice, this is extremely difficult to, to achieve because every disease has their own uh, fans and stake, I mean, not fans, but, you know, people who are concerned. And, and so there's this, you know, struggle for attention and funds that's, that's really, um, you know, fierce. Um, but, uh, you know, giving more attention to the, to the economics of it, the benefit-cost ratios, 
would help us advance on the reducing the pandemic and epidemic risks, and you know that would include the One Health approaches. Um, so what is necessary for One Health? This is now Im implementation, okay? This is after sort of my sporadic involvement in this area over 10 years, is you need leadership. There is a, a real need for leadership from the human health sector, okay? If um, One Health hasn't really made inroads in the way we work, it's because the human health leaders have been uh, sort of absent or not, you know, not engaged, not nowhere as enough as, as you know, as warranted by the huge um, health impact on humans in terms of you know, preventing um, disease. So you need a captain with authority and data on risks you know, like wind and how to steer these programs. Then every sector has to have defined um, tasks, okay? Um, and you have to, um, they have to coordinate or, or be aware of what the other uh, stakeholders, the other sectors are doing, okay? And so since it's a screw and captain, uh, and they have to help each other also. They have, you know, dif they're different tasks, but they, if necessary, they have to help each other because the, the objective is a common one. It's not like my organization and your organization. It's, it's you know, there, there's a need to reduce the burden of a disease. Um, so you see where this is going. This, <laughs> this is going to one boat uh, <laughs> because if they are you know, not working this way, they'll lose the raid, uh, uh, race. This one minute video, okay? There's a, okay, this is. <laughs> okay, so there's a captain. You see the captain? And then, you know, this is like uh, human public health and animal public health and the environment. <laughs> And watch what they are doing. So um, I think that's that's clear on the on the <laughs> on the need for collaboration <laughs> and the need for leadership um, because you know other, other, it's, we're in one in one boat. Sorry, there's the resources on, on the last page is something. There's a discussion group on Facebook about One Health that you know is eager to have some medical professionals and human health professionals, human public health professionals because there are more than 4,300 4, members, but it's heavily dominated by veterinary and, um, and from the whole world. So, so it's a very, very global um, tool for engaging and, and discussing. And there you saw, this is the various literature on uh, economics and uh, One Health. Thank you. Um. So our, our last uh, technology-related uh, event in terms of uh, a different technology for, uh, for this, this conference in terms of global health is to have the pleasure of having Dr. Juanes talk about a safer uh, network for pandemic uh, preparedness, but to talk specifically about climate risk and emerging infectious diseases in One Health approach. Great, thanks so much. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers uh, for inviting us uh, to this important event uh, and for using the technology to, uh, to be able to connect to you uh, from uh, uh, far away. Uh, so this presentation will be uh, just to give you an overview, a quick overview of the magnitude of emerging infectious disease, uh, some facts about the timeline of outbreaks and their impact uh, on human uh, in terms of uh, um, mortality, morbidity, but also the economic impact, 
and then we move to the risk drivers uh, of uh, emergence. And I will focus on uh, three uh, areas, uh, the land use change, uh, climate change, and the weather related disasters. And uh, finally, I will talk about uh, the solutions uh, and how we see the One Health approach is uh, the way uh, to go about uh, uh, reducing the risk from these drivers. And one particular uh, uh, importance is the research gap and what the health system uh, can provide from uh, information uh, and uh, knowledge uh, to fill this uh, gap. This is, um, I think, some of my uh, previous colleague, uh, previous speakers, uh, they talked about it. So just a reminder that 60% of human, uh, existing human infectious diseases, they are also zoonotics. And each year we have five new human diseases uh, appearing and three out of uh, them are zoonotic. And finally, uh, very important for our global health security agenda, that 80% of the agent with potential bioterrorist uh, 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 characteristics, they are also uh, zoonotic uh, uh, origin. Um, this graph just shows, uh, shows us uh, the increasing uh, number, frequency of, of uh, the outbreaks, the major outbreaks, epidemics and pandemics from 2002 until 2015. But also we have to mention that the increasing intensity of these outbreaks are also a very important feature uh, of the new uh, diseases or the, uh, the re-emerging diseases. And uh, um, uh, an example of that, uh, the current outbreak happening in, in DRC uh, of Ebola uh, where it's uh, the second largest uh, uh, on record uh, so far. Now, this human uh, impact of global outbreaks in terms of mor mortality, number of cases uh, and morbidity, but also uh, in terms of the economic impact, which is not always uh, proportionate to, to the number of cases or the number uh, of uh, death. Uh, for example, in SARS, uh, uh, the economic cost was uh, $54 billion uh, in, in the year that we have because uh, uh, the impact of uh, uh, pandemics, it's not just on the health sector or on the individual, but also on all of the uh, aspect of societies, including the economic ac activities, uh, due to trade and uh, uh, international uh, travel uh, restriction uh, that uh, might be uh, imposed on the country because of the outbreaks. Now, uh, the global and country uh, drivers of disease emergence between 1940 and 2005, this graph shows that mostly it's related to land use change and uh, uh, the use uh, of this uh, service land for agriculture int intensification and food uh, industry changes. But we also have other factors uh, tied to, to this, uh, including the human susceptibility to infection that it's uh, um, changing. And we have also the uh, antimicrobial resistance um, um, really, uh, contributing to, to the drivers. Uh, the the uh, right-hand side, uh, side of the uh, screen showed us the location uh, of these emerging uh, diseases. Um, and we can see that uh, no uh, country or region are spared uh, of uh, the emergence uh, of infectious diseases. Um, now we uh, uh, focus on uh, the first uh, uh, risk driver, which is the land use change. And it's related to, to the urbanization, unplanned urbanization of our cities uh, and the municipalities, but also uh, uh, the effect of so social erosion and degradation, desalination and de desertification. Now, uh, with regard to deforestations, uh, we are losing about two to three percent of the global forest uh, each year. And mainly we are losing this forest, we clear the forest uh, to use it for agriculture, 
uh, but also for other uh, uh, type of uh, uh, production for uh, and industry uh, related activities. But for agriculture, the cropland and the pastures occupying 40% of the land services. And the largest uh, loss that is happening now, it's particularly in the tropics in Africa and in South uh, America. Now, in terms of urbanization, we know uh, for now, we have 50% of our global population living in cities, but by 2050, this number will increase uh, to around 70%. But the spread and the scale of urbanization bring to us tremendous challenges. It widens our inc income gaps, worsening our pollution. We, will, we see in this graph that the rapidly growing African cities are the most likely to be impacted by the climate change. But also following uh, them, we have Asia, we have also the Americas, uh, they will be um, uh, impacted uh, uh, by the climate change uh, in the cities. Uh, our aim is to enhance our urban resilience to climate change and to disaster risk. And we know that uh, now we have 90% of all our urban cities located in the coastal areas. And they are increasingly facing uh, risk from hurricanes, floods, and other natural disasters because of the climate change. But we have an opportunity. In 2015, uh, member states signed on the new urban agenda, which, which is a global uh, commitment uh, to uh, 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 do urbanizations uh, in a sustainable uh, way that can protect our de development gains uh, for our generations uh, to, to come. And we have the, uh, the opportunity from now until 2030 because we know that for sure 60% of the places that will be urbanized by 2030 are yet to be built. So we have a, a window of opportunity uh, to act on the urban agenda. And we have a lot of current ev uh, efforts in this regard to make our cities a green uh, inclusive, uh, bland, resilient, productive, safe, and healthy for the, the populations. I listed some of them, but we have a lot of effort going on around the world. And I will uh, focus in this slide on the healthy initiatives uh, that uh, the WHO is championing in the European regions as an example of the health sectors joining uh, uh, efforts with the climate uh, change uh, uh, sectors and the environmental sectors to make our cities uh, more resilient uh, to the impact of climate change, but also to related disasters uh, risk. And this is uh, just an example of the checklist that the cities has uh, to ensure uh, that uh, they, they meet uh, this checklist uh, uh, so their city can be healthy. Um, some of the adaptation strategies that cities can uh, uh, implement uh, to ensure the health and well-being of the populations, uh, including the land use uh, policies, but also special uh, planning and zoning, building codes and flood proofing measures. And these uh, uh, measures, they are proven to reduce our risk to uh, a substantial uh, uh, percentage of 25 uh, to uh, 45% uh, of the overall risk uh, to uh, our cities. Now, uh, the climate change further complicates the situation of the urbanization challenge. And we know that by 2030, it's estimated that climate change and natural disaster will push more people into uh, poverty, millions of them from urban residents into uh, the poverty trap and uh, the uh, related uh, health consequences of this. Now, we know the impact of climate change. It's not just the direct impact because of the damage, the illnesses uh, that uh, uh, we have from uh, uh, the exposure uh, to uh, extreme events. Uh, for example, the death toll exceeded 70,000 uh, in Europe during the summer of 2003 when we have the heat wave. 
but also we have the indirect impact that it's mediated by environmental factors uh, such as uh, the air pollution and, and the impact of climate change on vector-borne diseases and waterborne diseases. I will give some examples later on. But also we have the socially mediated effects of climate change through the interactions with our social and human system um, and uh, 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 the, result, the resulted mental illnesses, population displacement and uh, uh, other uh, consequences. Now, the example of climate change, uh, I will give an example of the dengue fever. Between two, uh, 1990 to 2013, about 450 percent increase in the number. And, and this is uh, related to uh, the changes in the climate change um, and the weather-related uh, events. And for example, we know that the warmer locations in the Southeast Asia are mostly serve the, uh, the sources as the outgoing waves of the dengue uh, across the regions. And we know that there's uh, synchronizations between the incidence, the high incidence of uh, dengue fever in 1997 uh, to 1998 with the uh, elevated temperatures that have been throughout the regions. And also uh, during this time, the region experienced the strongest El Nino episode of the century. Now, an, another example of vector-borne diseases is malaria. And we know that malaria is the vector, uh, the disease that most sensitive to the long-term climate change. And it's also um, varies seasonally uh, in endemic areas. Um, and uh, the link between uh, climate change and uh, malaria have been studied uh, in many regions, and I will give example from India, for example, in the early last sen centuries, uh, the excessive uh, monsoon uh, rainfall and the high humidity in the Punjab area was identified as the major influence enhancing the mosquito breeding and survival, leading to increase in the malaria cases in the region. Uh, the recent in analysis also have shown that malaria epidemic risk increased around five folds in the year after El Nino events. Um, another example of vector borne disease is chikungunya. It's also closely tied to the weather related uh, uh, weather patterns in Southeast Asia regions. Uh, but uh, uh, we witnessed uh, the uh, spread uh, from uh, South Asia uh, uh, and Africa to Europe and North uh, America because of the uh, changes uh, uh, in climate uh, and weather. And the uh, first uh, uh, outbreaks happened in Europe, in, in Italy in 2007, and from there it, uh, the risk uh, 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 spread to Western Europe uh, and then to uh, the central uh, part of Europe. And uh, for the US, uh, the first uh, outbreaks um, um, or the death uh, because of uh, chikungunya was uh, uh, reported in July of 2014. Now, uh, related to the climate change is uh, the disasters uh, because of natural hazards. Um, and uh, this graph shows us uh, the increasing uh, uh, number uh, of uh, disaster uh, uh, throughout the years, uh, but also increasing the share of uh, uh, meteorological and hydrological disasters, uh, such as storms and floods, uh, uh, landslide and uh, avalanche uh, in, in the, uh, among the natural disaster uh, perspective. But uh, not just uh, the increasing uh, number uh, and the frequency, but also the increasing intensity uh, was recorded uh, in the last uh, sen uh, century. Uh, this is from a recent publications uh, that give us the trends of natural disaster uh, between 2008 and 2017, but it doesn't include the damage because of the uh, due to epidemics. Unfortunately, most of the uh, disaster-related uh, studies or publications, they don't include the uh, bio threats or the uh, epidemics and outbreaks uh, into the natural uh, disaster category. 
So uh, from this trend, we know that uh, in the last 10 years, we recorded around 3,751 natural disasters. 84% uh, of them are uh, weather related. Um, and as I mentioned, mostly they are uh, floods uh, and uh, storms. And now 2 billion uh, uh, population were affected uh, in a way or another of 4% of the people affected, they were affected by weather related hazards. The economic cost of uh, uh, the disaster was huge. It's, it was uh, estimated to be costing uh, around $1.7 uh, billion. Um, and uh, just uh, to, to mention here that this is a huge underestimation because the system that record this uh, type of disaster uh, doesn't record all uh, uh, scale of disaster. So if the disaster is uh, small or localized, it's not recorded in this system. And we know that the frequent repeated uh, localized disaster are uh, um, uh, mostly responsible for the large uh, number of uh, uh, damage and uh, uh, death. Now, beyond the damaging and destroying physical infrastructure because of the disasters, we know that uh, the risk of the outbreaks is uh, uh, increasing uh, following disasters. And this is associated with the size, with the health status and the living conditions of the people because of the disaster. Many of them, they will be displaced, uh, sitting in crowded areas, uh, in shelters, uh, some of them, they will lack uh, water and sanitation, and they will lack access to uh, proper health, health care. And all of this will increase their uh, risk of communicable disease transmissions, including waterborne diseases, uh, diseases associated with the crowding, uh, uh, like measles and um, acute respiratory infections and also to vector-borne diseases and sometimes to uh, other diseases like uh, tetanus. However, uh, uh, the picture is, is not uh, very clear here on, on the types and the magnitude of uh, infectious diseases following disasters because we don't have the data and the data uh, is batch, uh, that we have is batchy as, and documentation, it's not strong. Now, if we, we need to, to reduce the risk, we have to work on all the component of the risk. It's the hazard and uh, the exposure and the vulnerability of the populations and also uh, the, their coping capacity uh, with the uh, disasters. Now, the solutions for all of this, I would argue that it should be uh, the One Health approach, that it's people-centered, that is uh, working uh, to address all the hazards, including the bio threats and uh, uh, the approach that involve all the relevant sectors uh, in, in, uh, uh, in its uh, myth. And, and the main uh, area that uh, we are working towards now is mainstreaming health into national action plans for uh, all the, uh, the relevant uh, global frameworks on biodiversity, climate change, disaster risk reduction, and the urban agenda. At the same time, the health sector is working to integrate and to mainstream climate risk into the health systems. And just to give you an, uh, an idea how uh, this um, uh, effort is difficult, because we don't have comprehensive database of the national action plans uh, at the country level for disasters or for climate uh, uh, adaptation. Uh, uh, but from what we have, uh, we have seen that majority of the, uh, the plans, uh, they don't yet include uh, health uh, into their uh, um, um, uh, uh, overall uh, areas. Now, what's required from us uh, is when we do the mainstreaming uh, of climate risk and biodiversity and other uh, global uh, factors uh, for the emergence of uh, diseases into the health system is to think uh, uh, comprehensively through the system-based approach where we, we look at what are uh, the stressors uh, and uh, we look how to increase the resilience of the populations by decreasing their vulnerability 
and at the same time increasing their capacity to, to deal with them and, and uh, working on, on all the areas, uh, all the phases of uh, uh, disaster, including the recovery uh, after uh, uh, the event. In the health system, uh, the mainstreaming uh, and uh, the health status of the populations and uh, uh, develop uh, the uh, uh, technologies that is climate resilient and sustainable and also make sure that the health infrastructures are also uh, resilient uh, to, to all types of hazards. Um, uh, a main uh, issue here is the finance for the health resilience. Uh, it's uh, still um, uh, lacking and I'm sure uh, Olga, when, when she talks, uh, talked about the economic uh, uh, impact of the uh, pandemic, she touches on, on the finance uh, issues. Now we have an opportunities uh, in another global framework also to advance the resilience of the health sectors, which is the sustainable development goals, the SDGs. And we have one specific uh, goal, uh, number three, focuses on the good health and the well-being of the uh, populations. Um, and uh, um, uh, by working on this, we can relate to the other key environmental and social determinant of health and working with the other sectors uh, to ensure uh, the compre uh, comprehensive uh, um, uh, approach uh, to health through the One Health approach. Um, th now, I, I mentioned a lot of uh, regulatory frameworks and uh, global frameworks. Uh, so uh, we have a challenge to make sure that we have coherence and synergy between all these because they all will, uh, will be implemented at the country level, at the local level, at the city level. So uh, the, co the coherence and the synergy between them, uh, it's uh, uh, vital. Now, the final part of uh, my presentation, it's about the, the research gap. Uh, we have uh, like a graph uh, or outlined the pathway from the driving forces uh, through the uh, uh, health effect uh, or the potential health impact on the populations. Uh, but we still have a lot of areas uh, in this graph. It showed, uh, shows uh, by uh, uh, the arrows, uh, the dotted arrows, where we still have um, uh, a gap in our uh, knowledge and where the health sector uh, can uh, provide uh, uh, important uh, uh, contribution here. Now, just to give you an, uh, um, an idea about the magnitude of, uh, uh, of this uh, research gap, um, the number of climate change uh, papers uh, about health is uh, about uh, half of uh, that uh, other sectors. And certain health impacts because of the climate change, particularly the malnutrition, the non-communicable disease, uh, they, uh, they remain substantially under studies here. And another uh, aspect that uh, almost two thirds of all published uh, studies, uh, they are carried uh, out in, in Europe or North America, uh, but we are lacking uh, papers from the global uh, south. Now, um, we are working uh, to generate and share the knowledge um, and the science-based evidence. And, uh, and here in this slide, I just put uh, the, uh, four main re reports uh, that was recently published. One of them on uh, biodiversity and human health, one on uh, providing the evidence uh, and uh, the quantitative risk assessment of the impact of climate change on uh, selected uh, causes of death uh, uh, published by WHO. Uh, we also have uh, the Lancet uh, uh, Countdown uh, uh, just publishing their uh, 2018 uh, report. Um, and uh, I uh, would like to highlight the, the IBCC uh, climate change uh, uh, report uh, and uh, the chapters uh, that we have there on the human health, well-being and, and security. And, and th these are important sources of information uh, to support the implementation of the national action plans at the country level 
where policymakers are increasingly demanding science-based uh, uh, interventions. Now, my final message is uh, we have to uh, for, for health in general using our One Health uh, approach. And uh, to, to end here that prevention works. We have to work upstream instead of being uh, just reactive uh, and uh, focusing on the response and the humanitarian aids. Thank you so much. So we heard some great presentations uh, this morning. And I wanted to just uh, ask all of the speakers as we go through this uh, a leading question right now, is if you had one particular issue that you'd like, if you were the, if you were the, the, the head of state of any country, what is the one thing that you would drive forward to be able to advance the, the One Health Initiative? And I'll start with the folks here uh, today, uh, Billy and Olga. And then those on the on the line right now, please uh, pipe in right after that. So, uh, Olga, why don't you go first? Um, yeah, I think um, you know every state is a is, is a member of many international organizations, and maybe they are not quite following up whether these international organizations are producing the benefits that um, would be expected from such membership. So I think more of a um, more attention to you know how are the international organizations starting with WHO and OIE and and the World Bank and IMF how are they serving us collectively because this is a global problem I mean that's one thing you know no one country can actually um, I mean these the pandemics and epidemics it's it's it's, it's a it's it's uh, crosses boundaries in, inherently. Um, and so we do need these um, organizations to, to, you know, do something about reducing the risk. And are they doing enough? Um, how, you know, are they adopting the One Health approach? Since you know, it looks like it is very impactful and effective. But are they actually doing anything? So I think that that would be, a, you know, are they working as hard as they should be okay. for for the money that they get? Excellent. Yeah. So, if I was a policymaker, or if I you're the head of state, head of state, you're driving something forward. Yes. So one thing you would do. I would. Um, I would order um, my minister of finance, or in the U.S. we're approaching the office of management and budget, um, to say we want you to take a look across all the ministries or all our departments and come up with a cohesive financial plan and allocation for health that, if, that benefits the whole country, not the individual ministries or the individual sectors. And I would shift that conversation. So I think there's ways we can utilize the World Bank because they have influence with those ministries in different countries. There are different mechanisms. But I don't think I've always um, impressed when Olga shows those numbers about the cost savings and benefit, health benefits of, integ of integrated approach. And I think that comes from the finance side, the finance ministry. The other part in the head of state, though are in, currently we seem to be trying to do that here, um, but typically not, um, is engaging the private sector and getting the private sector engaged would be part two. Thank you, Billy. Uh, Liz, can you hear us? Did you hear the question? I, I did, and I can. And can I have two things? 1A one and 1B, one sure. And Frank, you're going to go after Liz. Please, go ahead. OK. Um, the first thing I would do um, is shift the conversation from emergencies to health system strengthening. So I think there's way too much focus on emergencies. and and. If, if we shift that back a little and try and make sure that every country has a strong functional health system, both public health systems and animal health systems, that um, that will go a long way to making sure that in an emergency that these countries can function effectively. That goes to Billy's point as well, because that has to be financed. Um, but I, I'd shift the conversation away from emergencies is the first thing. 
And the second thing I would do um, is to make sure that the um, Minister of Education um, it makes uh, a mandate that every student in any, uh, at any university or any in-service training program um, gets some training in taking a multi-sectoral approach and does some kind of cross-disciplinary uh, scenario-based training in problem solving. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Frank, can you hear us? Are you still there, Frank? Okay, maybe he'll come on board if, if, if he is. Uh, now, I'm gonna ask one more question. I think for the folks here in the audience, please get your questions prepared and ask a question so we can take it up to the end of this and you'll be able to direct your question to anybody here, including Liz, who's still on. So start thinking of your questions now and I'll repeat them for the audience and for the, for the video camera here right now. Uh, the second question I'd like to ask is on the issue of communication. We all know what the issues are amongst ourselves, but we have a major challenge in communicating to the public at large and making them aware of what we know. So I'd like to ask, and I'm going to go into reverse order. I'm going to, Liz, you just asked, so I'm going to ask uh, Billy first, Olga, and then Liz uh, after that. Uh, how would you communicate what we know in a way that's going to enable the public to get engaged in what we're doing. So, Billy, do you want to take a hold of that one? Um, I, I, I was going to start listing off all the cool things you should do, um, but you probably just don't have time. So <laughs> I'm going to back off from that and talk about maybe engage partners, stakeholders, whatever you want to call them, in the um, communications world, in the media world, in the journalism world. Uh, we actually had invited a writer from the New York Times here today who are professionals in that and know how to do compelling uh, stories. And, and I guess in the modern world, that would include YouTube and other forms of social media. And, um, get them engaged in what we're doing and let them you know, take their expertise and their excitement out to get those messages out. Um, I've had colleagues that say, well, I will never work with a journalist again um, because I've been misquoted or misinterpreted or they bend the story a certain mm -hmm. way that doesn't represent my view. And um, I'm always saddened to hear that. And, um, and I would say the opposite of that. I would always, you know, encourage everyone, oh, there is a journalist in the New York Times, I see you now. I would encourage everyone to interact um, with anybody in communications and media because if we're going to stay on this theme of One Health, it's about this uh, collabor collaboration across disciplines um, and partnering and using each other's strengths rather than, as Liz said, we don't need another a One Health silo and try and do everything ourselves. The whole point of this is to find strong partners um, and messaging as part of that. Great. Thank you, Billy. Now, I'm going to go to Olga and Liz, but Billy, for one or two of those really cool things that you ha have, I'm going to close with uh, that before we go to the audience. So one of the cool things that we can communicate to the public, not only in prose, but also maybe in visual ways, because One Health is such a cool thing visually, right? This is very gripping stuff, and I, I know... Uh, you're going to speak, uh, Raphael, about, about uh, snake bites in parts. So if you want to know about snake bites and what a public health, neglected public health emergency that is with 125,000 people losing their lives every year, Raphael, put your hand up. Talk to that man there. He's going to tell you all about it. So Olga, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you know, on communications, one of the sort of main problems and that communication is very important in this area, especially because of the behavior point that I talked about. And the, um, the events are fairly rare, the emergencies, and then as Liz just said, you know, maybe there's too much focus on, on, on the emergencies. And, and um, so it goes in, in, a, in a cycle that goes up and down, which is not, um, I mean, it's not helpful. So between emergencies or, or when you know there's um, uh, sort of peacetime 
Um, how do we communicate the risk? Um, can we, you know, still, because you still need um, to, to um, give decision makers an incentive to, to act. So you have to tell them what's going to happen if they don't give you the money to, you know, have the public health systems that, that, are, that are needed. So they have to be sort of scared or you know, alarmed um, adequately between, between these events. And how can you best do that without um, you know, getting accused of um, exaggerating or, um, you know. But on the whole, it's clear that the risk is not being communicated well because these defenses are, um, you know, this 3.4 billion that I mentioned in low income countries, the actual spending is maybe one eighth, one over eight. So it can go up eight times to get to the performance that you need to stop diseases. So there is a you know, huge opportunity for being more scared and <laughs> putting more money in it <laughs> to, to actually fix this problem. And that it's a problem, it's, it just doesn't enter public con consciousness between crises. And even some crises just you know, become like, oh, you know, a ball in Congo, so what yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So Dr. Vora just uh, joined us, but I'll, I'll ask you that question after, um, after Liz and then Billy Finch. And then I have another question for you, Dr. Vora. Before we go to you in the audience, Liz, do you want to give us uh, one A or one B in terms of your uh, guidance? Yeah, I actually had to, but I was trying to decide. Um, so, I mean, I think the public and, and communities in, around the world need to really understand that they have a, an enormous role in protecting themselves and, and their communities and that it's not up to the external public health service necessarily, um, but it's really about, about them. So somebody um, identifies a sick bat lying on the ground in somewhere in a market or something somewhere where there's lots of people and in, and you know deals with it puts a bucket over it and calls somebody or something instead of having some kid touch it so that we all have a responsibility to 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 make to protect ourselves and our families and our communities I'll I'll stop there that's the important one thank you Liz and uh Billy, one or two of those very exciting thematic <laughs> ways that we can tell the story. Tell the story, get people mobilized. Uh, well, I have examples just from the last week. Friday night I was at a party and I met a documentary filmmaker and we were talking about work and, and some of the One Health issues and it just kind of came up and said, well, why isn't everybody doing that? And I said, well, cutting down the forest, one group of people make a lot of money and another group of people pay for all the diseases that come from this. So our Johnson & Johnson friends understand this very well. Um, to, in not doing it, but trying to stop that. I'm going to give you some credit for that. Um, and the filmmaker said, well, that's fascinating. How come no one knows that? And I go, because, I don't know, maybe you, know, you could tell a story. So I just got an email from her this morning saying, we want to follow up and do a documentary about this interaction there. So I would take the opportunity you have any time when you're meeting people and talking to people, of course, to get them engaged. That's an interesting, compelling story that somebody else can tell. I can't tell it. Um, all I can do is steer them in the direction that way. Another one, um, some friends, and I guess maybe you live in New York, you meet people in the, in the communications industry a lot, who wanted to do a show, a drama on poaching so I introduced him to contacts in South Africa from our work and said, can you help this person out and do the show on poaching? Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, but I don't want to do a documentary because no one watches documentaries. We're going to have like sex and violence and <laughs> all this good stuff and make a successful show. They've gone to Netflix and Netflix is picking it up and a German film company just invested $8 million. Um, and I know it'll be a lot of nonsense, but in some cases I don't care because I think it's going to get the story out to people that otherwise wouldn't pay attention. So I think there's, you know, you'd be surprised how many times you might just have that opportunity and you don't think about it and you let it slip away. But it's, um, I would just encourage everybody to, you know, tell that story to every. It's great cocktail conversation, of course, <laughs> with all the work you do. 
um, and take advantage of that. Wonderful. And then just before we get to Dr. Bora, I, I want to, at CUGH, we've been trying to grapple this. So there's a couple of things that I want to share with you. One is we know that people's attention spans are very short. So we created something called Stories from the Field. So this is a, actually a plea mm -hmm. to all of you to tell your stories in sharp visual means, as, as, as Dr. Kresh mentioned, in a way that's actually not only appeal to somebody's brain, but also appeal to their heart. Grip them by their heart. So you, they're short. You put them together, we show them on YouTube, and then we use all of our social media platforms to share it. Stories from the field, please submit it through cugh.org. The secondly and issue, and then and Jill is, and Catherine are doing this today, is we have a very good relationship with the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting. Most of their material is gripping and important, and take it, look at it, share it. At CUGH, at our annual conference, we created a film festival with them, and, and Liz, uh, Jill, sorry, Jill and Catherine are doing it here. So whenever you're having meetings, feel free to go and take that material from Pulitzer, show the relevant stories. They're powerful, they're important, and I think, as Billy, as Billy and Olga and Liz said, there are ways to communicate with the public. And so that's a good segue to Dr. Vora. Uh, Dr. Vora, this, you and your colleagues at the CDC are extraordinary public servants working under often difficult circumstances, you, as you quite grippingly describe being under bat urine or guano, whatever is going on, um, in the public service. So please share with us how we can be better partners for you and your colleagues to tell, disseminate, share the solutions that Liz mentioned that can be used on an individual basis and at a community basis, what people can actually do to be able to support the One Health approach. Um, thank you. And sorry, I was late to the panel, so I got, I got caught up. I, I would start by saying again what, what I mentioned in my talk, which is clinicians are just such an important part of what we do. So now I work out of the New York City Health Department and it's really astute clinicians that are the first to detect an unusual cluster of illnesses. They're the first to think about, wait, what I'm looking at uh, is a syndrome that's consistent with a hemorrhagic fever. Let me call the health department. And the health department uh, in New York City, I mean, it's just an amazing agency. And, and we're really here to support local public health response. But you know, the local is global now on. I mean, everything is interconnected. And so um, you know, what can, can the general population do? First of all, I mean, this type of educational uh, uh, informational exchange is, is extremely valuable because we're all uh, learning together and, and we're hearing so many great talks. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm not a public relations, or, you know, I, I'm not an expert in, in, in community aspects of, of One Health um, uh, advocacy, but uh, you know, what, what I'm seeing today is just a ex fantastic example of, of how to, to stay informed and engaged. Thank you, Dr. Boris. So I'm going to go to the questions to you, but just as a reminder, Public servants can't advocate for what they're doing. That's up to us to do. We are the agents and the drivers of the outstanding work that Dr. Vora is doing, the folks at NIH, the folks at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Those are public investments into public goods that are created, but they can't drive the stuff out in the ways that we can. So whenever we can, if we can take your work and share it, use it, get others to use it, that's our, our challenge, to, I would say, to do that. So I'll stop and just say, if there are any questions, please put your hand up. And uh, Dr. Weiss is going to guide them along. Yes, sir. And please direct it to the person that you want. After hearing your, your lectures, which were very interesting, and what you are saying to the world, how can you support your, your wars in practical ways in a country in which the president doesn't believe what you are saying? the war on the war, whatever happened with the, the, the fire in California, or just now when Argentina didn't sign uh, what everybody else signed about the Paris Agreement. How can you yeah. move ahead with your ideas and with your project? Is that directed well, you're Canadian. Oh. And <laughs> <laughs> let's put the government employee on the spot. <laughs> 
I, I can't comment on like <laughs> you know, every aspect of what you're asking. What I would say is that you know our agency mission is is the same. You know, even though one administration changes to the next, the the CDC mission stays consistent, and and we're a nonpartisan agency, and so we're doing our work, and it really doesn't matter whether you're uh, you know whatever your political party is. At the end of the day, an Ebola outbreak is an Ebola outbreak. Uh, a measles outbreak in New York City is a measles outbreak in New York City. So, um, you know, infectious diseases don't care about political affiliation. And I think it's important that uh, we spread the word, you know, when we, when we see these concerning health threats and really emphasize the, the impact on human lives, on human suffering, and also on the economic aspects of this. You know, we, we heard a lot about that, but um, the economy is integrally, uh, is, is, uh, is linked to our health and our well-being, and so you know these outbreaks have an impact in that area as well. So, if I just want to get, uh, if I could, uh, Lewis, a couple of things. Uh, if, if you either you want to respond, Liz, do you want to respond to that at all? No. Okay. So, just if I may, one to respond to that as a bit of an outsider. There's incredible innovations taking place within this country. Uh, Dr. Mazet is here from California. Look at the work that they're doing in California. Look at the work that Michael Bloomberg has done through cities. How do you build healthy cities? The urbanization challenge. The next two billion people are going where? In cities, right? Building healthy cities is a great opportunity not only for dealing with one health challenge, but also to deal with NCDs. So there are innovations taking place across this country. There are a, a willingness amongst cities, amongst communities, amongst states, Take that, work with those, the, a coalition of the willing, and implement, implement, implement. And people can do that on an individual basis. We can all reduce our environmental footprint individually. Cities and states can do the same thing, and in fact are doing that. I'd like to add something. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, that. and then um, it's always fun to beat up whoever, whoever's in charge. Um, every administration. It's, it's great sport in this country. Um, but, you know, there was an article in the New York Times actually, also Sunday, yesterday, um, that interestingly enough, you know, laid out that it's not just a climate issue on these fires. And there are some actual changes in forest management practices over the last 50 or 60 years uh, that need some attention. And also about um, land tenure and ownership and responsibility rights. So, Interestingly, you know, there's always a little more complicated story than what we hear on the, you know, the headlines or the or the Twitter feed, um, and so I think you know, a lot of these are decadal, you know, longer term problems. So you know, those of us that are not in politics, you know, you're kind of like, yeah, it's big news, um, but then you just go back to work, and you know, you keep pushing forward on those issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. All uh, next question, please. Sorry, can I just stay, oh. say something as well? Yeah, please go ahead, Liz. Yeah, and I'm not sure I captured entirely the, the point of the question, but I, I think one of the, I mean, if we're talking really about this forest issue, and I think Billy brings up a good point that um, there's a variety, and he, he also made this point with the, um, the previous statement, which of course I'm spacing on, but the, the difference in interests um, uh, uh, from different stakeholders, and and it brings me to that exact point. I mean, if you're talking about forest management, then you have a you have a, a variety of stakeholders. It's just not the forest people. Uh, you have potentially um, people who are dealing with tourism in there. You have people who are potentially farming nearby or next to it, or people who are going in to do different things. You've got a whole bunch of different people who have different perspectives and experiences. And then you maybe you have um, you know the super uh, militant. Um, are not climate people, but environment people, the ones who are outside the box. And, and all of these perspectives needs to be taken into consideration when you're already starting your forest management project. I think this is one of the problems with how we've run our, our programs in the past is, you know, the wildlife people have been involved in the wildlife projects and not anybody else. And Billy talked about that in his opening session, but the more people we involve in the, in the, uh, in the whole proce process from the very beginning, the more perspectives you'll have 
the the information will be richer and then the the outcomes that you have the management decisions and those kinds of things will be more implementable because the stakeholders all of the relevant stakeholders will have been part of the process of decision making thanks thanks liz next um, question so i have a question down here please introduce yourself one sentence just so we know who's asking Hi, I'm Steve Mercy from Scientific American, where we don't risk all people. Um, <laughs> just wondering, when you save a lot of money because something bad didn't happen, it's invisible. So how do we make that visible to the public so that it looks to them like the money we do spend is an mm -hmm. investment and not just overhead? No. Yeah. Good well, yeah. I think you know that's often the excuse that you can't see the benefit of prevention because like nothing happens, but it's not true that nothing happens. You know, uh, the bad thing doesn't happen, and so if you can vividly describe the bad things that can happen, you know, maybe not for sure, but some probability. I mean, that's I mean, we're all these scientists coming up with. Uh, you know, probabilities of spillover, and, and we know that there's a frequency to pandemics. I mean, that's, that's sort of objective knowledge, but it's not used. But in the Scientific American, you could, you know, write about <laughs> the horrible things that could happen, but because, the, you know, the world is different now. There's much more flying about, and the population is much greater, right? So there are some sort of underlying factors that are not favorable. Um, and, um, you know, if, uh, I think people understand prevention. I mean, it's not, I mean, people are not dumb, right? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, Warren Buffett is investing without actually seeing the benefits too. He's putting down money into, you know, buying whatever he's buying companies and stuff. And he doesn't really know, I mean, he knows a little bit about what they are about, but he doesn't know that they are going to make him 40% a year, right? So he's, he's, that's realized only sort of exposed. So that's the same, I mean, same thing. He doesn't see the benefit when he's, at the time he's spending the money, right? He expects it. And so do we. <laughs> Thanks, Olga. No, but it's a, it's a tough problem. Yeah. I mean, that's why we have this, you know, this sort of cyclical, up and down emergency and, and sort of complacency and neglect. Hello, my name is Dominic Fortuno. I'm the Associate Dean for Long Island University School of Health Professions. Uh, we train a number of different clinicians from physician assistants to rehabilitation specialists, public health, social work. We've talked a bit about clinicians and how important they are as part of the process. Um, what sort of things can we do on the side of the training programs at the college level to sort of promote One Health, to promote the One Health approach, to promote these sort of collaborations? Okay. Do you want to go ahead? I, I can t speak to that a little bit. Go ahead, Liz. Perhaps. And then... Go ahead, Liz. Yeah, I, I, I think that, I think really the there's some didactic things you can do around One Health. You can talk about, you know, the importance of it. You can present Olga's numbers and and those kinds of things in in terms of convincing clinicians. But we haven't been very successful in convincing medical personnel on the importance of this up till now. And I think part of that has to do with the way that clinicians are taught. I don't think it's just me that thinks that. I think. That's the standard thinking is that clinicians are taught to, to treat an individual and not really, whereas veterinarians are taught more at the population level, so it comes a little easier. But in answer to your question, I think that clinicians are, are smart people and, and, and the other populations you were talking about that you're training. And as soon as you can show the benefit of, of working together, um, it, it, it becomes blatantly clear that there's no other way to do that. And, and so I think scenario-based training, I've, I've mentioned that already, and, and certainly if you can find 
um, a like-minded uh, additional other programs in your area where you can bring students from other sectors together into some kind of, of workshop situation, seminar series or something where they actually have to work together and to solve a problem. This is really the, in my opinion, the only way to effectively teach One Health approaches and, and collaborate, collaboration and cooperation to solve a health issue. Um, and the other thing I just want to say, so that I'm not all blackness and, and uh, concern in my, my statements, but I mean, I'm finding when I speak to students, they just get it. I, and they just get it so much better, this next generation. I, I, I mean, I feel like my generation, um, you know, we were still sort of stuck in this human animal environment, even though we're not really wanting to be and we're trying to think about ways to sell the other sectors. But in fact, you ta start talking to students and they they already get it and they already start thinking about, you know, that in the technologies that they need for snake bite to prevent whatever. And I mean, it's amazing. So I think tapping into that innovation is also something that we need to be better at as a health community mover. So, oh, do you want to go ahead? Go, go ahead and then I'll go. OK. Um, no, please go ahead, Dr. Bora. After you. Uh, OK, just very quickly, I would say three things. First of all, it was its exposure. Um, you know, for me, the Epidemic Intelligence Service was my uh, opportunity to get into public health. I learned about that when I was very young. I watched the movie Outbreak when I was a teenager and I knew I wanted to wear a spacesuit and chase these types of diseases. But um, not everyone has like those opportunities to, to see these movies and learn about it. So in you know undergrad and in graduate school, giving people, uh, letting them learn about what's out there, not just like you know uh, a narrow pathway forward to, to some end. Um, and, and the next thing I would say is mentorship. I've always benefited from great mentors, and Billy is one of my mentors. I met him back in 2009, and he was one of my windows into the One Health world, and so I'm you know, very indebted to the opportunities he has given me, but mentorship is just so, so important. And the last thing is support. You know, like uh, I have friends who went to other med schools. I found my med school extremely um, supportive of my um, decisions and where I wanted to take my career. My residency program was the same way. Uh, in speaking to other students, though, I've, I've heard that some institutions are not as supportive. But you know, when, when a student is passionate or when a young professional is uh, passionate about a certain career trajectory, and I would point to Kendra, a doctor, in the audience today, I've been so impressed with how dedicated um, she is to pursuing One Health. You know, the institution really needs to support those um, uh, young students and professionals in, in pursuing their dreams. So Dr. Fortuna, I, th I think there's a, f a few things just to add on to that. One is, is curricula, second is competencies, and the third opportunity, which is quite exciting as I mentioned in my talk, was uh, experiential learning between vets and something else. So vets and dentists, vets and physicians, vets and nurses, vets and public health professionals to go out and actually provide combined service, particularly for those in low resource communities. As I mentioned in my talk, that example, I think it was in Texas, where the window into low resource communities to get access to, to them was actually through their pets. So providing vet care for pets in low resource settings, but, but at the same time bringing in dental students to bring in uh, public, to bring in primary dental care or senior medical students, all of course under supervision, uh, to be able to provide uh, you know, primary care, nurses similarly, and you can bring in others. The other thing, of course, is to bring in the non-biomedical folks. We heard very clearly the need to be bringing in lawyers, economists, engineers, uh, social scientists into this. So it's actually going to the dean level and, and convincing them that the 21st century challenges are different from what we faced before, and we have to pivot the training of our, wor of our workforce into the future and integrate One Health into this. Tomorrow's session is how can One Health be applied to current medical school curriculum and practice. Um, so I will shill, if you would, for those of you to come back tomorrow to, to address that question. That is actually one of the goals of why we have the Einstein Global Health, what these semi-annual uh, every other year conferences are about. They're really about that sort of global health, medical school curriculum, operational aspects of, of global health global health centers. Do I didn't see anyone else raise their hand. Do we have any other questions? So I think uh, we have one other question up there and then, and then we'll 
go to final comments from the panel, and then I'll give you some operational things. Thanks. I'm uh, Greg Gray from Duke University, and we've been engaged uh, in both One Health training and research for some time. Uh, one of the things I think that's uh, been very illustrative of engaging both uh, academia and professional trainees has been creating incentives for them to work together. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas A&M, I thought, came up a pretty good program of doing that internally when they had multiple colleges they could draw from and internally offer uh, significant financial incentives uh, to have faculty work together on a specific One Health related project. So that was something they could do internally. It wasn't NIH funding, but it was, uh, it was great. And the response, I'm told, from their administrators was just uh, amazing. And they were so excited. In a similar fashion, the Gates Foundation has had grand challenges uh, to tackle problems in a One Health way. What we haven't, and, and I understand those have been uh, successful. What we haven't really seen uh, are the big uh, funding uh, from, for instance, from the NIH. And somehow I think we need to find ways to make what has now got a lot of traction, One Health, uh, become a, a focus for significant research and training uh, dollars at the federal level. I don't know how we approach that, but that would seem to be a next step. Anybody want to comment on that at all? But, uh, just agree. Yeah. But just, just for everybody, just at some time in the break, uh, Greg, just to know that Dr. Randall Kramer and others at your institution have been doing phenomenal work, and also how Duke actually you constructed that ability to be able to do what you've done to bring in people different disciplines into the global health field is very interesting. And you had a dedicated, and this is important, Dr. Fortuna, to your question, what they did at Duke is they, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, they had a dedicated vice provost that was dedicated by the, by the provost to, to be focused just on bringing the institution together and finding the creative ways in which you got uh, uh, faculty across disciplines to be able to provide interdisciplinary, true interdisciplinary training for the students. That's a fascinating example at Duke and what they managed uh, to do. So we have one last question. One last question, sorry. Yes. Yeah, hi, I'm Rafael Rodriguez from Faculty of Medicine, University of Team, Switzerland. Um, I'd like to add some, not too loud, um, I'd like to add a couple of more examples from my own experience, but probably I'll keep that for, for, for tomorrow as you, you anticipate it. But I would like to switch a little bit the conversation. I'm always so impressed by, I mean, the EcoHealth Alliance and, and all of you, how you manage to get the conservation message into the global health arena, which I think it's pretty impressive and very, very, very important. But what are the challenges? How do you see this? Because not the whole global health community, not even the whole One Health community is so much into conservation as you are. On the other hand, I see there's a very strong opportunity for both conservation for health and health for conservation. Um, how do you see this evolving? Because I have the feeling globally uh, um, you're kind of a unique, powerful movement, but this is not happening all over when we talk about global health in general. Really? Uh, well, well, thank you for saying that. I mean, I think our approach is just to be constantly reaching out and finding groups, you know, that have the shared interests. So the um, United Nations Environment Program is, is challenging to get them along. There's some programs within that, the Convention on Biodiversity has been very excited because they, for them there's a co-benefit that health might help them achieve their goals um, and they've been working closely with WHO on moving that forward so they can do things we could never do. So I think it's constantly looking for groups, uh, UNISDR with the Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. So that's why I was saying earlier this morning is look for some opportunities that might just be you attending some meetings first and getting a sense of the landscape and then where you might um, be able to get engaged. Um, that's my only recommendation, and just you, I just encourage you all um, to you know push the envelope. So, 30 or 40 years ago, there was physicians for a nuclear disarmament. Like, who would have thought of that? Except a group of physicians got together and said, "We're going to step outside our comfort zone and go push for something." And so, 
I think with our medical students, there's an opportunity. It might take another generation because the faculty have to kind of come around too before they encourage the students. Um, but in medical training, either veterinary tr medical training, nursing, um, physician training, you're already teaching these students to be multidisciplinary. They call in a neurologist for that specialty, or they send somebody to radiology, or they need a nutritionist. You're already teaching them to work across. It's just a little more of a stretch to say, well, maybe you should work with somebody. How about over in the business school to think about this problem a little different? Or give them a project, you know, with some engineers that are going to deal with all that plastic waste they use in their office and throw away every day. And, you know, start pushing a little more uh, for those students and give them a little more to think about. Um, and in the business world, for you, I think it was for both of you, I think the next thing for the next generation is to figure out how to make a lot of money from prevention. Because we know how to make a lot of money in response. It's very profitable. And developing a good drug to trick sick people is a very profitable business. I haven't figured out how to make money from prevention, uh, like except maybe the sports industry is figuring out if you get people to exercise more, so they're figuring out how to profit. But the fire alarms, somebody figured out here, we can make money from smoke detectors. Um, and that had a regulatory effect, so maybe we need a policy that requires it, and then you let, you know, there's, you need some kind of economic incentives. It gets back to you. Although you're saving money doesn't mean much. How about making money? So maybe we need some creative ways to make money from preventing disease. Well, folks, I think we're, separate, we're, the, we're separating you from lunch. So uh, please, on behalf of, uh, put your hands together for Dr. Mumford, Dr. Koresh, Dr. Jonas, and Dr. Bora. Thank you very much.